Buenas tardes, everyone. Thank you for being here today. I'm going to call this hearing on Wednesday, June 12th. My name is Carlos Manchac. I'm the chair of the New York City's New York City Council's Committee on Immigration. Thank you all for being here and joining us for today's hearing as we take a deep dive into the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs Annual Report on calendar year 2018. I want to thank the members um, of the committee who are not here yet, actually. Um, I will say that we're in the middle of budget negotiations, and so uh, there's a lot of things that are kind of happening today. There's three other hearings that are happening today. I will be leaving to go to that hearing for a quick moment, so I will, I will disappear for a few minutes. Um, but this is all in the spirit of doing the good work for the city of New York. Over the last year, we've had numerous hearings touching on specific programmatic features of Moya's work, from legal services for immigrants to IDNYC, our municipal ID program. Through the last two budget hearings, we've gotten the opportunity to ask specific questions about the resources that are being allocated to these and other programs. Today, we want to look at the data that informs the programs and policy decisions made by the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. How many of you have read this? Raise your hand. Awesome. We have a warm crowd here. If you haven't, uh, you can go on your, on your phone and, and download it and, and walk, walk through it with us. We've said this before, but it bears repeating. Now more than ever, we are at a critical point in our history. Repeated and calculated attacks on immigrant New Yorkers are being orchestrated by the White House. These attacks have been pervasive, targeting the most vulnerable through rule changes proposed for non-cash benefit recipients, deploying immigra immigration enforcement at state courthouses, including a citizenship question on the decennial census form, and acting to end temporary status for DACA recipients and TPS recipients. Now more than ever, it is critical that we make decisions and take policy positions informed by data. Looking at driver's licenses for all campaigns, uh, the advocates have been calling for driver's licenses regardless of immigration status for years. Finally, the data coming from Connecticut where similar legislation passed four years ago is providing the benefits, or sorry, is proving the benefits that advocates have been describing. Namely, that 50,000 undocumented residents of Connecticut have taken the required driver's tests and obtained driver's licenses. As a result, the state is reporting a 9% decrease in hit and run accidents, uh, crashes, and a sharp decline in individuals found guilty of unlicensed driving. This data even translates to revenue for the state, an increased revenue derived from the state DMV fees. It's metrics like these that can help make the case for similar policies in New York. With an eye to the power of the de data, the council passed two laws in 2017 to expand the scope of MOYA and ensure that programs and policies were informed by information and informed by data and coordination amongst the uh, agencies, which is integral to the work accomplished for the success of all New Yorkers, foreign born and native. I'm referencing local laws 185, 186 of 2017. The 2019 Moya report provides descriptive statistics on the immigrant population of New York, touching on the socioeconomic realities faced by this population. The report describes federal and state activity that has had an impact on immigrant New Yorkers before reporting on the many activities Moya itself has engaged in over the last year. The report ends with a list of broad policy recommendations. As we have di digested this report, the result of Local Law 185 of 2017, 2017, we have four areas of concern that we hope to address during the hearing today and look forward to continuing this dialogue as we move into the next year. Moya's calendar 2019 reporting period. So these are the following concerns that we have. One a lack of consistent citing and detailed methodology. 
making it difficult to decipher the descriptive statistics that were determined. Two, a general disconnect between the descriptive <laughs> statistics included in the report and the programmatic activities described. Three, a lack of success metrics for programs described, making it difficult to measure the effectiveness of MOYA programming. And then finally, number four, a lack of clear descriptions of MOYA monitoring agency efficacy in conducting outreach and serving immigrant populations, as required by Local Law 185, and further facilitated by MOYA's task force created by the Local Law 186. I look forward to digging into these concerns today and hearing from MOYA staff on ways to improve this report so that moving forward we can be stronger together ensuring that our programs and policies are truly motivated by data and benefiting all immigrant communities and all New Yorkers. I want to thank the staff who prepared for this hearing, uh, the Committee Council, Harbani Auja, and Committee Policy Analyst, Elizabeth Kronk. And with that, I want to invite the administration to join us at the, at the, uh, the dais over here. And I want to welcome our commissioner, uh, Vita Mustofi, and uh, Sabina Fong from the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. And I also want to welcome the two council members, council member, uh, council member Danny Drum from Queens and council member Matthew Eugene from Brooklyn. And uh, we'll, we'll get you sworn in now. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. Now? Okay, great. All right. Um, thank you to Chairman Chaka and members of the Committee on Immigration. My name is Vita Mistofi. I'm the Commissioner for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, and I'm pleased to be here with Sabrina Fong, our Deputy Director of Research and Policy Advisor at Moya, who is also available to answer questions. Um, I'm excited to testify about Moya's annual report, which covered our work in 2018 and was published in March of this year. This report is a testament both to the extensive work that our office does in serving immigrant New Yorkers, as well as the crucial research and analysis that Moya conducts day to day. Moya works with quantitative and qualitative data to inform program and policy design, both for our office and our sister agencies, to engage in advocacy at all levels of government, and to tailor our outreach to communities in need. Uh, my testimony today will discuss some highlights from the report, our analysis of demographic and program data, and how we use that analysis to inform the work. I look forward to discussing this important topic with you. This year's annual report, our second ever, included new data on immigrant New Yorkers and a detailed discussion of Moya's successes in 2018. Beginning with a few notable demographic highlights, I want to start with the decline of undocumented immigrants living in New York City. This decline is in line with national trends that predate this, the Trump administration. Other research has shown that there has been a decline over the last decade. As noted in our report, this can be attributed to a number of reasons, including a weak US economy following the 2008 housing market collapse improved economic conditions in the country of Mexico, as well as heightened enforcement at the border. In this year's annual report, we presented a profile on household and family level data for the first time. This data shows that millions of US citizen New Yorkers are deeply connected to the undocumented population. Nearly 60% of New Yorkers live in households with at least one immigrant, and over a million New Yorkers live in a mixed status household including over 200,000 U.S.-born children who live with undocumented parents or other household members. Included in our demographic profile of the immigrant population of New York City is an exploration of the many economic contributions of immigrants. We know that over 75% of undocumented immigrants are in our labor force. That is higher than the labor force participation rate for the U.S.-born population, which is about 65%. Immigrant New Yorkers are employed in a wide range of industries with over a quarter working in the key industries of education, health, and human services. And in 2017, immigrants contributed an amazing $228 billion to the city's GDP. 
Our report also highlighted ongoing demographic disparities by immigration status, including economic disparities. Although immigrant New Yorkers participate in the labor force at the same or greater rates than the New York City-born residents, um, in the U.S. immigrants' median earnings are significantly lower than those of U.S.-born residents, especially for undocumented residents. The median earnings for U.S.-born residents is about $49,000 compared to about $26,000 for undocumented residents. Not surprisingly, undocumented immigrants have higher rates of poverty than New Yorkers more generally. According to our colleagues and our partners at NYC Opportunity, the NYC government poverty measure shows that the poverty rate was 20% for all New Yorkers in 2016. When accounting for immigration status, this jumps to about 23% for immigrant New Yorkers and about 31% for undocumented immigrants. The report also helps MOYA monitor changes and disparities over time. One area of good news is in, the health in, is in health insurance, where the gap has begun to close, due in part to the Affordable Care Act and the city's efforts to expand insurance com coverage, including a campaign by MOYA in 2016 to connect DACA-eligible uh, immigrants to Medicaid. The uninsured rate for non-citizens declined by about 14 percentage points between 2012 and 2017. More work remains to be done, and Moya is excited to be working with our partners at NYC Health and Hospitals in the rollout of NYC Care, which will help ensure that all New Yorkers have access to the health care that they need. Part two of Moya's annual report looks broadly at our key initiatives, programs, and achievements. I have testified extensively about some of this work in recent hearings before this committee. To emphasize just a few of the office's successes, Moya has coordinated multi-agency responses to various cruel and anti-immigrant policies on the federal level. This includes family separation and the proposed changes to the public charge rule. Moya expanded the poll site interpretation project to the largest it's ever been, sending interpreters to 101 poll sites and serving about 2,000 voters in 2018. For immigrant legal services, our report highlighted the expanded city investments in immigration legal services, including removal defense, support for separated families and unaccompanied children, and expanded immigrant legal services in Chinese, Korean, and South Asian immigrant communities. Action NYC providers conducted over 9,500 comprehensive immigration legal screenings, an increase of about 21% compared to 2017, and opened over 6,200 new cases, an increase of about 28% compared to 2017. As part of the response to family separation, the city allocated $4.1 million to legal services for migrant children. And as a part of an initiative to serve hard to reach immigrant communities, Moya coordinated the training of eight community-based organizations who then were able to provide immigration legal services. The annual report has proved popular with stakeholders eager to use the data we provided about demographics in our programs. We held briefings for elected officials, including the council, as well as for community groups. In addition to publishing the annual report on our website, we shared the report with over 80 community-based organizations over email. We distributed over 777 physical copies of the report, including over 700 copies to community members who attended our Immigrant Heritage Week celebration at Gracie Mansion and those who attended the Nauru's events, and dozens of copies to agencies, public and private healthcare staff, and our library partners for NY citizenship. The response has been very positive, and we've heard anecdotally that the report has been useful both for advocates and for community members. In fact, our report has been extensively cited by multiple media outlets, including NYC Noticias, uh, NY1 Noticias, Korea Daily, and the China Press. This shows the desire for the kind of data and analysis that the program uh, and program data that the report produces. Turning to our work in analyzing the demographic data, Moya plays a key role in quantitative and qualitative analysis for the mayor's office, city agencies, and the city at large. Central to this work has been our ability to use data to highlight ongoing disparities and barriers that exist within immigrant communities and that are often dri driven by differences in immigration status. To make these estimates, we work in close partnership with our city agencies and demographers. 
developed by NYC Office of Economic Opportunity and in partnership with our national researchers such as the Center for Migration Studies, the city has developed a methodology to use American Community Survey data to estimate the city's various immigrant groups, including the undocumented population. The ACS is a national survey that the U.S. Census Bureau administers every year on 3.5 million households. It is designed to produce reliable estimates on small areas and smaller population groups, covering over 35 topics such as age, employment, education, English proficiency, and place of birth, amongst others. The ACS makes this data available at the individual response level through the ACS public use microdata sample, which are the anonymized individualized responses to the survey questionnaire. It is this microdata that serves as the foundation for the demographic data found in our annual report. Beginning with the non-citizen population in the microdata, we make a series of assumptions, which we call, or the researchers do, logical edits, <laughs> based on characteristics of what we know of non-citizen populations to infer legal status. Assumptions that infer status include occupations that require legal status, receipt of certain public benefits that require status, and certain immediate relatives of US citizens, among others. These assumptions help distinguish legal residents and undocumented immigrants in the survey data. Next, in order to further validate and refine our estimates, we perform an adjustment based on recent federal immigration data looking at actual visa and green card numbers that arrive and or adjust status by country of origin. This step called country controls ensures that we can more accurately adjust our estimates to reflect the changing immigration patterns over time as well as to better account for the diversity of New York City's population in our estimates. Finally, we adjust the estimates for undercount of the undocumented population by about 7.5%. We use undercount assumptions that are consistent with undercount rates measured by the Census Bureau over the last few decades. The ACS data is released in one-year and five-year estimates. For this year's report, we chose to use the single-year estimates in order to provide the most up-to-date snapshot of the city's immigrant population. NYC Opportunities methodology, as described, is a result of decades worth of work from statisticians that has made it possible to come up with an increasingly accurate way to estimate the undocumented population in New York City. However, as with any form of estimates based on a sample, we are always subject to some error as well as some misclassification errors based on our logical edits. Additionally, because our methodology is centered around the ACS survey, our analyses are limited to the variables presented in that questionnaire. We are incredibly proud of the work that we've done with NYC Opportunity, and I'm gonna go off script one minute to just acknowledge Vicki Virgin, who's here, who's really been the core person who's developed this, so thank you, Vicki. Um, and this methodology and the data that we have produced with it have allowed us to look deeper into the needs and the barriers of immigrant populations and families that we have ever been able to ever before. Moving now to the program data, given the range of the programs that we oversee, we collect and, and analyze a wide variety of program data. The data shows our successes and challenges remaining for us, both in terms of growth and in terms of concrete effects that the programs have in our communities. Choosing what information to collect is a central part of program design. For that reason, the information we collect represents the diversity of the programs that we run and the differences in the goals of such programs. For example, knowing how many IDNYC cards have been issued is important, but the, when planning for the future, it's equally important to understand why people seek out IDNYC and how they use that card. Not every data point is collected for every program, as collection of certain information can impose a burden on the people we serve and uh, the organizations that we fund. For example, the administration's policies and local laws actually prohibit us from asking about immigration status for most programs, and with good reason. Asking about immigration status when there is no need to do so can cause alarm amongst immigrant New Yorkers, especially in this climate, 
and chill service and uptake. Given the limits on the types of information we collect, there are corresponding limitations in how we can analyze that data. However, it's important to note that data we collect at point of service is the starting point and not the end of our own analysis and understanding the efficacy of programs. There are other tools that we can and have used, like focus groups and surveys, to glean additional information about programs and how they serve immigrant New Yorkers. In addition to informing program design and outreach, data plays a critical role in bolstering our advocacy work. We regularly share research with stakeholders in other cities to help advocate and educate about the impact of federal policies on immigrant New Yorkers. For example, with the 2018 DREAM Act fact sheet that we published, we were able to demonstrate that this bill would have benefited 150,000 New Yorkers in our city. With data, we are able to make our advocacy more compelling, painting a fuller story about the population. For instance, that in that group specifically, on average, they arrived here at the age of 11 and had lived here for 10 years or more. This fact sheet is just one example of how our office uses data as an important tool. Other examples include our fact sheets presenting what increased immigration enforcement looks like in the city, as well as what the impact of public charge could be in our city. These tools help inform our policy discussions as well he here as well as across the country. We use both demographic and program data in designing programs that we oversee. The Poll Site Interpretation Pilot Project is a good example of a program that has been deeply influenced by demographic data. That is because our analysis of where there was need for this service was heavily based on where there was eligible voters with limited English proficiency, uh, for which the BOE had not provided interpretation services. For the November 2018 general election, we analyzed languages spoken by the greatest concentration of eligible voters with LEP by poll site and identified six languages for which we could provide assistance with additional interpretation. We then identified 101 poll sites with the highest concentration of eligible voters with LEP. We also often use demographic data in targeting outreach as well as producing materials. On multiple occasions, we design and translate flyers for outreach we are doing in certain neighborhoods based on what we know about the demographics of that area. Again, demographic data is just the starting place for this kind of work. In many cases, we will organize events meant to reach certain harder to reach communities, even if they are demographically smaller and harder to count. For example, we held the first ever Garifuna and Central American Town Hall in the South Bronx in collaboration with multiple city agencies and local community groups. Finally, Moya employs a mix of methods to continually evaluate our work. This includes analyzing the program data described above and administering additional surveys, interviews with our providers, and conducting focus groups directly with community members. These conversations with our partners in the field help supplement the story that we get from the data. Moya's annual report is a great source of information, we hope, for our partners across the city. By highlighting both successes and challenges ahead, the report provides a picture of the work that we do every day. In coalition with our many partners across the diversity, we will do our utmost to build a city where everyone, irregardless of immigration status or place of birth, can achieve their goals for a better future. Thank you again for calling the hearing and we look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Commissioner, for your, uh, for your testimony today and presentation. I wanna rec recognize Council Members uh, Margaret Chin from Manhattan, Council Member uh, Moya from Queens and Council Member Miller from Queens as well. Thank you for being here today. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna start with one question and really preface it with saying there's no doubt that the partnership that we have is, is critical in really building uh, budgets and laws and, and policies together. And when we first developed Local Law 185, it was really under that, that premise of trying to figure out how we, how we can expand your ability as the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to give us a set of detailed reporting. Yep. Um, and you went through some of them, and I think it's, 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 it's important that we're gonna, we're gonna kind of drill down. We hoped it would be a self-evident that we wanted a robust set of reporting that followed universally held tenets of publication. I think that's what we're gonna be showing you, um, how we found that the reporting itself did not meet publication standards. 
Uh, for example, consistent citations, uh, which appear to be missing throughout the report. Uh, and it's from this vantage point that we'll ask some of the questions. And the first one that I wanna, I wanna point out uh, is something you actually mentioned in your, in your uh, testimony on page three, at the bottom of page three. Uh, you talk a little bit about the, log the logical edits and you kind of really do a great job of explaining what logical edits mean and how you can take this micro data uh, with non-citizen population. And the report states that New York City is home to approximately 477,000 undocumented immigrants, uh, but didn't have a site. And those are the kind of things when we think about publications mm -hmm. from the government, uh, especially New Yorkers who are helping us build policy is problematic. Thank you for addressing that in the testimony. I think that's it's important. Um, but that's a consistent issue that we saw throughout the report that I think don't meet our expectations. Can I respond to that? Sure. OK, great. Um, and obviously, Sabrina is here who can go even deeper as needed. Um, so I guess the first place I'll start is to say um, the, I think this collaboration has been hugely important and valuable, and I think it's worth noting, and credit is due to the fact that this is the second such annual report ever. <laughs> um, the fact that something like this has previously just not existed, um, and really an intentional and thoughtful way of um, requiring, and I think uh, creating an expectation that the city cares enough about this pop these populations that it's going deeper and understanding who they are, what their challenges are, and how we can best be responsive to them is tremendous. And I, th you know, I, I'm super very grateful that that is a shared uh, goal of ours. And I think um, some of the challenges, partially that you articulated at the beginning, and I'm sure that will be a part of the, these questions are due to the fact that it's the second time, right? That this is a new presentation of how we as a city are doing this work, um, that, that even from last year to this year, we've made some changes in how we do the analysis based on our own learnings and understanding, and that really understanding what we're seeing in terms of an evolution of impact will take a little bit of time in the development of this research. We couldn't do, for example, a comparison this year, of this year to last year, because it was too short a distance, and the data or the changes wouldn't have been uh, immense enough or significant enough to, to put forward. So I think that is worth noting, and I think important for context in considering sort of why something might be there or isn't, is that this is new, um, and it is it requires a uh, a little some time right to get it right or to do some of those at that analysis and that consideration to answer to your question directly we very intentionally made sure in fact that the methodology was published <laughs> before we published this report um, and it is cited to um, actually the third footnote explains the methodology uh, how it's utilized um, uh, and then the fourth footnote, or sorry, yep, the f and the fourth footnote continuing does the same um, in speaking to uh, sort of the samples that are, that are used. And maybe Sabrina, if you wanna sort of add to that. Sure, I think in our third footnote, we, in, I guess, um, to avoid kind of citing every sentence almost to the same source, I think we just say, unless otherwise noted, all data is from this augmented file of the 2017 one-year um, American Community Survey estimates. And, um, but if I think it's helpful it, moving forward if we want more frequent citations if it's the same source, and we're happy to discuss that as well. Got it. So let me, let me just do a quick response, and then I'm going to have uh, Councilmember Drum ask us a few questions. We're all running to five different <laughs> uh, hearings at the same time, but I want to I want to say that I, I appreciate the the, the kind of um, the sense of, of newness and and, the, and essentially that's where we're having the hearing so we yeah. can we can kind of have an open public conversation about this we're going to hear from folks and I want to hear from a lot of you who come and testify um, whether you agree or disagree or what you want to see in the report as well um, part of this is to if we need to create more legislative 
uh, fixes to this, we will do that. And that's part of our work here. Um, I, think, I think, though, that, that this is a commitment that I want to see in the next, the next report. Citing is important. Every piece of data is so important to understand where it comes from uh, because, because that's, we're building policy around it. And as a municipal government, we have such little power when the federal government holds so much that we want to be able to make decisions at the budget level. And I'm just thinking about the budget stuff that we're talking about and how, how, we're, how we're needing so much information right now. When we think about our seniors and we think about our young people and we think about people who are going into detention and the programs that that this this has to be understood at the fullest. And when I can when I walk into spaces without understanding the data, it it uh, weakens the argument, and then I lose in spaces where we're negotiating budget. And that's that's not something that we want. And so this we're relying on on you based on the law that we passed to bring us that 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 data. And we're going to come back to some of the specific pieces. Um, okay, Danny, drum. From Queens. Thank you very much. All right. Hi, Commissioner. How are you? Hi, Council Member. Well, how are you? Good, thanks. Thank you for coming. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, I was looking through the report, and um, so I had some questions. Um, but I, I want to compliment you also on um, page 48, where you um, show the number of um, T you and T visa certifica certification requests and approvals. Yeah. It's gone up like double. Almost um, since 14, and I remember when I was immigration chair, you know, like we could hardly ever get any agency in the city to give us a certification. I remember yeah. pleading personally to uh, Commissioner Kelly at one time, um, you know, just trying to get something for a constituent, um, and how difficult that was. And so that is something to really be complimented. So thank you for that and for the hard work that you did to improve that process. Um, but I do have some questions on page 47. So, um, it, and it also involves the U and T visa certifications. Great. So the U requests um, actually are pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering why the T requests, there are virtually none. Yeah. Can you explain why that is? Sure. So thank you for the question and also for your commitment, both as uh, previous chair of this committee and also in your current capacity as a member of the committee. I come from this space. In fact, I was part of the coalition that advocated the city in um, prior to 2014 and then immediately after on changes to the U visa certification process. So this is deeply personal for me and a big part of what my practice was. Um, so thank you for, again, your commitment to this and for allowing us to um, present on what really has been incredible progress. I think to answer your question on T's, uh, it's a little complicated and something that we are actively engaged with. So um, one or two sort of factors of note um, that are important is um, trafficking investigations often have not or traditionally not begun at the local level. Um, they've begun at the federal level. And so often if a certification was being sought, it was not because, you know, to the, to the local federal uh, or enforcement rather a agency, it's the f it has been the federal one. Um, secondly, the way that, that um, T visa decisions have in the past been made, uh, the requirement of a certification wasn't always there. It's not actually legally required. Um, as I think we have moved into the realities of the Trump administration, seen a shift in the way cases are adjudicated and challenges in working with the federal government, this has become more important, frankly, and more critical for people going through that process. So we are at this moment engaged with both stakeholders and providers as well as local law enforcement to see how we can in increase access uh, to T visa certifications locally and what kind of changes need to be done or awareness building. Do you work at all with the courts themselves, with T courts? Because uh, like I know in Queens we have one and I believe almost every borough has a, t a trafficking court, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, so um, a p as a part of the kind of uh, coalition of groups that meet, we include within that the district attorneys from all of the boroughs um, and are engaged. And so um, I, they're an actor at the table with whom we are engaged, but also welcome thoughts on kind of engagement directly with the courts and 
uh, kind of ways that we can ensure uh, every actor that can play a role here is actively engaged in being a positive contributor. So if they're in traffic in court, is, does a judge ever inform um, the person, usually a woman, um, who uh, is before them of their right to um, apply for um, a chi visa? I admittedly don't know the answer to that. I think the answer is no, not necessarily. It's probably judge dependent. Um, but of course, next to those courts are the family justice centers where uh, uh, crime victims, trafficking victims are referred where there are ho there is holistic access to this information as well as representation. So, um, you know, we can certainly follow up to make sure that there's kind of active referral. Admittedly, in most of our engagement with courts broadly, uh, it's been harder to get prescribed, <laughs> if you will, um, th actions that judges have to take um, in these instances, but guidance and information can be shared, and so we can certainly follow up and make sure that there is some here. Uh, so what do you credit the um, increase in terms of the number of you requests? What, is there been more education on that, or why is there such a, a positive increase in that? Yeah, some of, some of the questions we are ourselves asking and trying to think about how we can better answer, honestly. But um, I think a huge part of that is, frankly, the change in the way that the city agencies um, both receive requests and uh, um, uh, issue decisions on them. So we, there was a m major overhaul at the police department, as you know, in terms of the systems before this administration it literally, a certification had to be signed by um, the commissioner himself. Um, so really creating a unnecessary bottleneck um, to the issuances and timely issuances of these. So there is uh, transparency on how uh, the decisions are made. NYPD actually went through rule promulgation to codify the process for issuance of certification to make it more transparent and also to include an appeals process within that. Um, and has continued to make adjustments along the way. Similarly, we've brought on board additional agencies who have investigative powers who had not previously been certified, including the Human Rights Commission and the Department for Consumer Affairs for the first time. Um, and uh, a huge part of that, of course, is ongoing collaboration with stakeholders, um, both in terms of uh, awareness of challenges that they're seeing and ways that we can tweak them, um, but also that they have access to this. We recently shared with the task force um, a one-pager that simply includes all of the points of contact and the way and, to, and where you need to go to make uh, certification requests um, as sort of a new addition to the tools that uh, stakeholders can use. And I've been talking about uh, sort of ways in which non-traditional actors, so not lawyers and others, um, can get this information. We have, as you know, dedicated page on our website um, as the way to make this as easy as possible where people not only see what it is, um, but how they can make the request. Um, and our work have worked with uh, the Department of Education and others in, in collaboration with you to ensure that information is shared out. So. Um, there's some great work that's been done and that is ongoing, and then I think there are other things that we need to better understand and make sure we're addressing. And ACS can do it because they are an enforcement agency? Or there's Invest an enforcement division within them? Or because they investigate. The child, right. right, okay. Yep. I get that. Okay, so uh, just at the bottom of page 47, the, the second graph, um, the first um, uh, category, public safety concern, uh, and you and this is in regard to UNT visa certification denials. Yes. So uh, what would be examples of public safety concerns for a denial? Um, so ag again, this is not, there's not one, one sort of prescriptive method by which each of the agencies uh, kind of make their determination around cooperation and willingness to certify. Um, and, and at the federal level, there isn't such, right? It is completely, um, uh, sort of bestowed upon the, the certifying officials to make the determinations on whether they will or won't certify. Um, and in so doing, while we have worked with agency partners to 
um, ensure a level of transparency for stakeholders, ensure that there's adequate due process in terms of being able to appeal if something is denied, um, and that they are being as inclusive and uh, sort of erring on the side of granting versus not. They have come up with their own internal policies and decisions. I'll speak, um, uh, for example, with NYPD, um, a safety concern is from their point of view um, where they see somebody uh, who has come forward with a request but for whom they believe that that individual themselves may pose a public safety risk because of their prior history, they may choose not to certify in that situation. Um, so as you can see, that's really the, the main agency um, that has sort of made those determinations and still considers that a factor. We're very interested in kind of hearing from folks um, what the outcomes of some of those cases are or issues that they're having or ways in which they feel they, that there ought to be a, a further conversation, but that is the position that NYPD has taken. So f from the way I'm looking at this, is it's fair to say that um, NYPD received 966 requests for UNT visa certifications and denied 158? It's not perfect in that um, this is a calendar year uh, uh, demonstration of the numbers, but, the de but there might be overlap from a prior calendar year um, for one of the denials, for instance. So I'd say that's probably an imperfect, but you could, you know, yeah, close estimation. Close yeah. And, and so just, I'd love to know exactly if we can get that information what they consider, what the NYPD considers to be a public safety concern. At what level is it? Is it a felony? Is it a, you know, a marijuana arrest or, you know, um, gang related or what is it? You know, I'd lo lo really love to get more information on that. And, th and I had a question also on insufficient documentation. Mm -hmm. NYPD has 19 of those. Mm -hmm. Do you know um, what is considered insufficient documentation? Um, so again, I think this is varies depending on the, the, the request. Um, so this might be that they've been unable to uh, kind of verify or confirm something. That, um, so either that the individual was a victim or did cooperate in some way. Um, so it's, it's a kind of case by case, but that's often what they're referring to is um, an inability for them to uh, feel confident uh, in, in demonstrating or certifying that that person or individual was in fact either the, w the victim or, or, um, or that the information that they received uh, fell within um, the, f the framework um, set out by the U visa uh, law itself so that there was a qualifying conviction for which this person was a witness or a victim. So sometimes people who come don't actually have the police reports, mm -hmm. right, or the incident reports, and so they have to um, uh, look those up, and sometimes they're unable to either find them or verify that what the individual noted what is it actually on in their records. So with the non-qualifying crimes, um, ACS had three and NYPD had 88 and the rest had zero. Would you know what portion of the appeals are to get NYPD to correctly classify the crime? Um, you know, they have a bit of a habit of underreporting. So I don't know. We can certainly circle back and with kind of more information based on the questions that you're asking on okay. PD practices. I would of course note that um, uh, NYPD uh, and ACS are our oldest certifiers. They have the bulk of the cases, so of course there'll be a disparity in terms of the number of denials that you see here. Okay, and then if I look on page 48 again, I see 44 appeals were filed. Yes. Right, okay. And then finally on page 45, um, uh, the last paragraph, in accordance with local law 185, which codified Moyer's responsibility to advise law enforcement agencies about U visa certifications and T visa declarations. Um, what does that exactly look like? What do you do um, in terms of advisement to the law enforcement sure. agencies? Sure. So we convene the task force in partnership um, with the mayor's office to end um, gender and um, domestic violence, gender-based and domestic violence, and. Um, uh, 
together we convene uh, all of the certifiers, not just the city agency certifiers, but the others. Um, we continue to try to, with that, also convene stakeholders, so um, primarily legal service providers and others who are operating in this space um, to understand, again, challenges that exist and, and the ways that we can address them with the agencies specifically. We've helped agencies come on board as certifiers through that process. We've created things like the one pager we, we distributed at the last meeting based on requests that we've received. We've also been working with agency certifiers around best practices. Um, so making sure, one, that there's consistency in the way that city agencies uh, do the work um, but also that there are learnings that are shared um, for the certifying officials. So this is an ongoing process for us. We have some ideas actually on things that we'd like to do in the coming year, um, but a lot of that is uh, kind of hearing what's working and what isn't, and also obviously looking at the data itself. So we welcome further conversation on these pieces. Okay, well thank you very much. Thank Always you. good to see you. You too, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Drum. Councilmember Chin? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Commissioner. I, you know, this is a budget season right now. And so I'm looking at your report. I was just wondering, in terms of outreach, do you reach out to OMB uh, in terms of, you know, the increase in immigrant population, numbers of LEP uh, adults? Because, you know, budget stuff that we've been advocating on, you know, like every year is a struggle just to get funding you know, stabilized for adult literacy. Still, the administration is not baselining. Senior services, there's a growing number uh, of seniors and the majority of that increase are immigrant seniors. So I guess my question to you is that, how is Moyer in terms of interacting with um, the city agency to make sure that there are adequate you know, fundings and service um, to, to help with the immigrant population? I mean, everything you have in your report, you're talking about housing and you know, the city council, we've been doing a lot to really supplement that and really push for that. But in terms of your agency, your interaction with these agency and also with the uh, Office of Management and Budget. Yeah, so thank you so much for the question. So I'll start with OMB, which is to say we do very regularly share um, both the report, but also a additional um, either findings, not just from our office, but ones that we either receive from our providers or stakeholders but um, or in the field or articles frankly that we think are relevant to these discussions and these considerations we often do share um, and are part of those conversations um, additionally I would say just this last month or in May I gave a whole presentation largely pulling from our report on the sort of status of immigrants in the city to OMB um, to many of their policy analysts and others who work across different uh, agencies and areas of work so that they can better inform and understand their work. Um, and uh, a big part of what we've done is um, shared both this information but also gone deeper in how some of this information has been used by bringing other agencies in to do uh, workshops or sort of talk through the way that they've used data in their own either creation of programs or policies with other agencies. Some as a part of our task force and some uh, more broadly. So it is an ongoing thing that we're doing. We definitely want to improve on it. One of the things that we did this year in the last several months was we actually created an interagency portal where um, agencies can um, uh, go to one spot that they have a link to that actually holds all of the in all of this um, information and data, but also some of the best practices and other sort of policy examples or program examples from other agencies as a way to have sort of a central resource that anybody that's doing policy or programmatic development knows uh, kind of where they can access some information that can support that. Um, yeah, but I think that that's great, but it got it a little bit more aggressive in a way that because I think that the population is growing um, in the immigrant community, uh, especially, you know, in the older adult population. And that's why like basic things like adult mm -hmm. literacy, we know that that could uplift, you know, 
a person to get a better job and be able to support their family, it's an important investment. Yes. And somehow it doesn't, the administration, it doesn't take it, you know, think it's important enough to really baseline. And every year we have to fight and fight. And the same thing with senior services. I mean, the, the senior center that serve immigrant populations, the 10 new one that the council support, uh, the administration has not, you know, supported that. And hopefully in the next RFP, I think we would need your help to push that we got to make sure that these center that serves immigrant senior get into the Department for you know, Aging's portfolio, that they do have a good chance of getting funding in this new request for proposal because we've been supplementing them for the last four or five years. So like we've helped to create um, the support, mm -hmm. but the administration really needs to to pick that up. Thank um, you for that. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd be very interested in sort of sitting down with you and talking about this specifically to just make sure that I can do my part, right, in making sure that we're being responsive internally and 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 uh, talking about these needs in a, in a real and holistic way. Yeah, and the, I, I just wanted to compliment the, the work on having the, the translators at the, the polling site. I think that's mm -hmm. critical, and we need to continue to expand on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Chen. So how do you measure the effectiveness of the legal assistance referrals that you provide? Um, looking at measuring how many people are seeking legal services, disaggregated by case type, uh, as required by Local Law 185. Uh, why is this data not disaggregated in the report? Uh, page 42 is where I'm looking at right now. Do you want me to respond? Is yes, that? please. Okay. <laughs> um, so thank you for the question. I think um, one of the things that you know you do when you're creating reports is also looking at sort of what else is what else exists and what where you're not being duplicative but supplemental um, in thinking about kind of what is out there. And I think um, definitely appreciate your feedback on the legal services specifically and sort of what you all have in mind in terms of thinking about the disaggregated data, that information is actually published. It's, act, it's published through our OCG report, um, where as an administration, we've centralized reporting on uh, our legal services contracts, uh, all immigration legal civil, and then included within that, of course, immigration legal services contracts. So we, where we publish uh, data not just on Action NYC, but IOI and others. Um, and have been intentional, intentional about making sure that the full view of what the administration is doing in this regard is in one place. And the OCJ report actually comes out in the same month that ours does, so we work very closely with OCJ, both on our report as well as theirs, and sort of just made the decision that that's the role that they will play and continue to play in publish publication of theirs and that we would we would paint the different pictures so that you could see it both ways. So appreciate your question. It's definitely available and public and we, that was intentional, but if that's the kind of data that you also want to sort of see in, uh, in, in here or sort of the duplication of it in here, we can do that. I'm gonna come back and do a final overview of everything, but I'm gonna go through some of the questions. Sure. Uh, what is the outcome of the legal assistance? Uh, do you have success or case outcome? You mentioned the OCJ report. Does that have that as well? Yeah. So I it mean, has like outcome, it has approval ratings and et cetera? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, it goes through, I'm sorry, sorry, just seeing the various charts. Um, it goes through the kinds of cases, sort of break down by year, um, uh, the kind of representation, whether it was full or not, um, and um, provides that uh, based on each of the programs, so IOI and Action NYC. Would it show also services and case types that have fluctuated since 2016 uh, when Action NYC was launched, and was that data tracked as well? So, um, no, I don't think so, but let me make sure I understand your question fully. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think, as you know, um, in the last five, six now years, we've 
created these programs, right? So um, they didn't previously exist um, for us to have a comparison from what predated them, if you will, <laughs> um, to now. And so I think we don't go prior to 2017 in, these in the reporting for that reason. We don't have data sets um, before those years. Um, which is challenging, certainly, in terms of sort of thinking about sort of I the increased accomplishments and the impact of these programs, but they, it just didn't exist because the programs didn't exist. But there's multi-year funding that Action NYC has done and can be compared between and the and, and, the, and the, the multiple years are in there. With, and I guess what I'm looking at is the fluctuations over time. Yes, so we so do that, give the fluctuation. Yes, we do. We, we provide for the increase in number of um, cases that were opened, number of screenings that were done, and so forth. Okay. Uh, on pages 15 to 16 under the health section, the report states that the gap in insurance coverage by immigration status also persists among <laughs> children under the age of 19, despite the fact that universal coverage is available for children yeah. under state law. Yeah. 18.6% of the undocumented children are uninsured compared to 2.1 of U.S. born children. Uh, this indicates that the gap is not a result of a lack of coverage, right. but rather a marketing information issue. Is Moya conducting outreach on health insurance coverage? How does NYC CARE fit into this? Um, the footnote 10 states that the NYC CARE program will guarantee health for every New Yorker. How will this program guarantee health care? For every New Yorker, what elements of NYC care are new that haven't already been done? Great. So um, to get to your first question on uh, awareness building for people who are insurable but not yet insured, I would say there's a sort of pre-NYC care um, uh, response and a post-NYC care response to that. So the pre is the administration started the Get Covered um, initiative um, and with that the public engagement unit a part of that unit is specifically uh, designed to um, in fact get people <laughs> um, mm -hmm. who are not yet insured but who are insurable which we estimate to be about 300,000 or so within the city um, coverage uh, to, to let them know that they're both eligible and also ensure that they know what their options are um, and uh, we work very closely with PEU. We do trainings with PEU around immigrant populations and eligibility. We do trainings around outreach and engagement with immigrant communities and how best to do that. Um, we ensure that our team has that shared information of what they do and can make those uh, referrals. We actually codified within Action NYC the uh, referral to um, health navigation or HNH for support for people who are uninsured or uh, need that support. Um, and um, I, I just want to step in really quick. You're, so you're, you're saying that there is marketing and information. I guess the question we're trying to ask is whether it's really about that. Is it a marketing issue? I mean, I, we certainly believe, right? I, and I certainly believe that in Engagement and intentional engagement in, is is an issue. It is a is a factor in why people don't get. And how are you measuring that effectiveness of that marketing? Yeah, and that's I think partially a good answer, partially not. But what I think what we learned, what we have learned, is we have seen gradually throughout New York City an increase in the number of people who have moved from uninsured to insured. We credit that increase to all of these factors, right? To having intentional outreach and engagement to communities and families, designed outreach and engagement for specific populations who we know are un uninsured but are insurable, right? NYC Care, one component of NYC Care is increasing the efficacy of Metro Plus and making sure that that 300,000 or so estimated population that's insurable that has not yet been connected to insurance is intentionally targeted and looked at through awareness building, marketing, and so forth. And then separately, the 300,000 or so who we believe either can afford or are, are uninsurable um, are connected to NYC Care itself. And NYC and H and H has hired uh, a team that is looking exactly at marketing, awareness building, and all of that that will supplement. Uh, what Get Covered is already doing. Well, and 
words are powerful. So this concept of guarantee healthcare for every New Yorker uh, in the report. Can you tell us a little bit about about that? Sure. Commitment and is that how how do we get there? Yeah. So again, we're as a total sort of looking at about 300 or so thousand New Yorkers who we believe are either uninsurable or who cannot afford insurance this time. Um, We are working closely with H&H and pulling from learnings that we've had around from Action Health and other um, initiatives that we've done to make sure that we're understanding the best ways to invite people into access to care. One of the challenges has always been just ensuring that there is enough primary care doctors, <laughs> um, right, to ensure that you can absorb that many people for primary care. So that is uh, a key part of what h h is doing through the NYC Care Initiative, is, is expanding and hiring the number of primary care doctors that they have. They're increasing training in, in both linguistic and cultural competency for those physicians. They're increasing access to specialty care. Um, in certain areas where we've seen particular uh, need and the num- the in- uh, greatest sort of number of referrals. And a part of the way that healthcare works for you and me, though imperfect, I think, for all of us, um, is having that coordinated system, frankly. And that absolutely doesn't exist. So in addition to what we just described and in increasing the capacity to do the work throughout the public hospital system, it is ensuring that there's a system that is actually supporting an individual and accessing those services. Outreach and marketing is a piece of that system, but the actual infrastructure where you have a phone number that you can call and say, I need to fill this prescription today, like where can I go? And you have somebody that's helping you navigate that is is something that doesn't exist and is built is being built as a part of NYC Care. So we're going to uh, shift over to the compliance on the local law 186 and 186 sorry 186 and 185 of 2017, and which I've mentioned in the opening and referred to in some of the other questions. So pursuant to the local law of 185, Moya is required to report on the efforts of the office to monitor agency efficacy in conducting outreach and serving the immigrant population, including the efforts of the task force. Now, the annual report discusses Moya's oversight work in the areas of language access and compliance with Local Law 228. Can you discuss how else Moya works in advising agencies to best serve immigrant populations? And can you give us some of those examples? They weren't necessarily reported in the annual and so we want to, one, let you know that that should be there. And then two, if you can give us a sense of that now. Sure. So um, I touched on some of this a little bit. Um, but through the task force, we actually spend a lot of the time within the task force at, uh, frankly, in part training, in part sharing information, building resources and tools for agencies to better serve immigrant New Yorkers. <laughs> um, that's a big goal of ours. Um, what Part of what has come out of that is just um, the importance of kind of learning from each other in terms of like what is what has worked and what hasn't. And Moya is not always the best or the only actor within the city that's doing good work in this space. And so what we've done with intention. This space being immigration, yes. immigrant family yes. space. Yes. Yep. Um, which is to bring in other agencies with whom we've worked or observed that they're doing a good job right along uh, certain lines. So by way of example, we've in, we have invited in um, uh, folks to talk about um, how best to work with LGBTQ immigrant youth in the city, initiatives that the city has, challenges or gaps that exist. We've invited other agencies to talk about outreach and engagement, specifically the Department of Consumer Affairs and how they engage with immigrant workers, um, understanding that population better. We've heard from agencies that a big uh, challenge for them is simply understanding um, what something means, right, in terms of federal impact of a shift or how it might um, change the way that they either need to do their work or how best to do their work. So we, uh, with intentionality, brief agencies on 
uh, federal changes, we share information and analyses that we produce or we work closely with an agency to produce uh, an analysis um, and make sure we're being responsive. I think by way of recent example, um, the new HUD regulation uh, that was proposed by the federal government, we are working very closely with our agency partners, both at looking at what the impact would be on New York City um, should that uh, regulation become final. Um, we're working collaboratively on submitting a comment um, together to show what the city impact would be, or sorry, what the impact would be on the city and immigrant families within um, public housing. Um, and we have trained our uh, tenant support unit and our housing support unit on uh, the regulation so that they're aware of it and they can give good information to families that have questions um, as well as staff. So that's kind of one example of being responsive to kind of concerns or challenges that agencies have been facing and how um, part of what we've done in the last really year and a half or so is frankly agencies come to us more proactively and we go to them more proactively knowing kind of that these things would be beneficial in being responsive immediately. So sort of not waiting, but immediately hitting the ground running together and looking at things. Last week, the Gothamist reported that four parents are suing the City Department of Education for failure to provide adequate interpretation services for their disabled children. Um, how does Moya collaborate with or monitor, DO, DO, monitor DOE's uh, provision of interpretation services? So we work really closely with a lot of agencies on um, interpretation services, as you know, um, DOE being one of them, DOE having one of the most robust, probably the most robust operation in terms of interpretation and translation with a whole unit that's dedicated to it. Um, and so this, certainly the, the, these realities are deeply concerning, not just for me, but for the chancellor. Um, and we uh, certainly work closely to both um, be responsive and correct uh, challenges that are existing and making sure that the system as a whole is not just responding to an individual case, but changing the way that things are done where possible um, and addressing the issues. So I think this is one example of that. I would be remiss to note that there aren't others. <laughs> um, there are others, and we are working with agencies kind of as a whole in being, in being responsive to language access concerns that are raised. Um, we will be receiving, uh, by the end of this month, I believe, the, the kind of reporting on compliance with local law 30. Um, so that is sort of one place. This is the first year we'll receive that reporting. Um, so it's kind of uh, the beginning of sort of a formalized uh, work with agencies to respond to some of these issues. But as things come up, um, as we uh, are either made aware of them or observe them or see them happening, we, we work immediately with an agency to try and resolve. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Councilmember Member Jonai from the Bronx for a couple questions. Thank you, Chair. Good to see you again, Commissioner. You too, it was uh, wonderful to see you at the first Yemeni uh, yes. parade in the borough of the Bronx. Um, an incredible day of proudness for that community uh, as they were able to celebrate their heritage. Mm -hmm. So it was good seeing you there. I'm glad that you made it, which Thank leads you. me into my question. How do we work with, or how do we get to these small pockets mm -hmm. uh, truly underserved communities, whether it be the Yemeni, the Bangladesh, Pakistani, Albanian community, um, and their various pockets. What are the outreach efforts that you're doing? Sure, so thank you for the question. I mean, I think certainly the place to start is to give credit where credit is due, to, which is to community-based providers that are really um, faith leaders um, and others who are really the kind of backbone for backbones for communities who might not yet have huge institutions that advocate for and support them, um, but who serve as those places where community members know that they can go to to get support and to increase access. 
We very intentionally have as a priority of the office engaging with communities that have had less access um, and have uh, do not necessarily have sort of their bigger institutions that represent them um, as kind of where we focus a lot of our outreach. Um, and that is kind of for that exact reason that we're kind of hearing from or know more about some communities because they have uh, representatives and long-standing institutions and, and power, frankly, and uh, that they're able to exercise, um, whereas others we won't, we don't necessarily have as much um, access to or know a, a lot about unless we're kind of proactively and affirmatively engaging. So I'll give some examples. Um, the uh, uh, Afghan community, for example, in Queens. Mm -hmm. um, this is a community that. Um, really doesn't have a ton of institutional support um, and is growing and um, certainly has the same needs as every other immigrant community in the city. So we've worked very closely with existing institutions or representatives from that community um, and ha have since about 2017 build, been building on the relationship that the office has with the community and its members so that we both hear from them, but also can uh, ensure that the resources that they need are either being deployed or that we can try to be responsive in how to do that. Right. So, and I'm following, so now if, this is if the organization, whether it be faith-based or community, reaches out to you, or if you have the information where you can locate them and you're reaching out to them, correct? Yes, though I would say many of these pockets have organizations that are not even registered 501 for C3s. sure. They yep. don't have offices. They don't have phone numbers. Uh, they just work with their community um, through some title, and they're off the radar entirely. And I can attest to that through my own community. Yes, I would say that's part of it. But the other part is exactly what you're describing, and often that is either a faith or religious community leader or community individual who's sort of the go-to, right, the person in the community that people know. Um, I think an, an, a community that's a good example of that that we work, have been working with and building with is the Uzbeki community in Brooklyn. They really don't have sort of those formal institutions. There are a new and growing population in the city. Um, we have, for the last three years, I think, engaged with that population, sort of understood some, even the sort of mosque that they go to, the imam, for example, doesn't speak Uzbeki, so we've been working with the mosque at sharing information, translating information um, for folks there and sharing that out. That's one example, and I think, I, it, I, of course, I'm being honest in saying it requires a little bit of a kismet, right? Like we, we need somebody or the community, or we're very intentional about trying to understand that, and so welcome sort of feedback on where we're not doing it that we should be um, or individuals we should be engaged with or meeting that maybe we haven't. So here's how I want to challenge you. Yes, please. Um, and this is creative thinking. No, looking at my own community as the example, not of the nearly 60 organizations that I know of, three are registered non-for-profit yeah. organizations we can actually empower them by helping them form 501c3s, non-for-profits. And they're doing some incredible work, feeding the poor, attending to the elderly, um, helping financially those that are going through illnesses and need medical procedures and raising money from all corners to make their life a little bit better. Um, I mean, short of God's work is what they're doing, but we haven't empowered them and I see that this may be the challenge ahead of us. And by empowering them, now we get them, they become a blip on our radar. We can track them uh, through their organizations and making sure that we provide them with the limited resources that we do have available, that it actually trickles into these communities. Mm -hmm. I would love to work on that project with you, the chair. I think yeah. um, this is something that you would embrace. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly have discretionary funding that with a $93 billion budget for New York City, somehow it never makes its way into these pockets, these isolated communities, and the only way we can do that is by helping them become a part of the process. 
yeah, we wel- I welcome the conversation and thought and just for my own uh, kind of uh, clarity, the Albanian community is specifically what you're talking about, or I'm using the know? Albanian community okay, as an example, example, but I can yes. assure you that yes. that's true for all the other yes. small ethnic pockets that exist. Yeah. Uh, so I, and I believe that, that this is something that we can do quickly, quick turnaround, and yield a tremendous result in having communications. And we also sent a, a uh, conflicted message. Not too long ago, the city took the position that in a city-owned property <coughs> where there is more than one flagpole, no ethnic flag could be flown. The perfect example is not too far from here, Wall Street. A NGO installed the two flagpoles, three flagpoles, I think it is. One is always for the American flag, rightfully so, and the other one they change from the state flag, city flag, but they also celebrate ethnic heritage, Mm -hmm. Independence Days. City Ada takes a heavy-handed approach saying no other flag can Mm -hmm. be flown on city-owned property. How are we truly embracing our immigrant community if we don't let them display their symbols of pride on a special day of independence or heritage. So thank you for the question. I think I'm not as familiar with this as maybe you are, but I'd like to follow up. I'm assuming uh, the Parks Department is who you are engaged with? This is a citywide uh, initiative at okay. this point. Where, and I, this is not in lieu of or replacing the American sure. flag with another flag. This is where there is more than one flagpole exists and traditionally, in these areas, they've been celebrating for many a years sure. various nationalities and ethnicities. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to follow up and make sure that I'm educating myself on sort of what, if there's a legal or policy decision that was made and why, and circle back your way. That would be tremendous. Great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Jonai. And on the the latter part of the questions they really spoke to this concept of hard to reach and there were no definitions uh, in the report about what that means do you have a sense about what that means for moyo's perspective in the annual report sure um are you are you speaking to a specific area or just broadly uh broadly but really it's specifically so that we can kind of address the issues yeah that are connected to programs. Yeah. So um, we look at a number of factors when we're uh, sort of using those terms or making those assessments. They speak to um, uh, the kind of size of the population, um, the uh, reticence of a population to engage or not have not engaged right um, with us in some way, um, language um, uh, that they speak and whether or not that's covered or we can see demonstration that they're engaging with services or not based on language. Um, It speaks to uh, the number, as I said earlier, kind of institutional uh, existence of institutions that that advocate for support um, the communities or not. Often for us, it's when we're looking at sort of uh, either programs or funding, it's um, also geography and diversity is uh, of that geography and sort of where uh, places are as a consideration. So um, as I said, sort of a number of uh, factors kind of go into what community may or may not be hard to reach, I think. Um, we certainly, when we're looking at programs, um, are looking at sort of where services exist um, and kind of to the best of our abilities under trying to understand uh, who is accessing those services and who aren't. Um, and sometimes that's challenging, again, because we as the city don't ask for or hold some of that information for intentionally, right? Um, and sometimes we can... Uh, based on uh, reporting requirements that we have with existing funders, uh, or fundees, rather. Um, And so we have um, looked at kind of for specific programming, uh, 
harder to reach being, again, kind of where services already exist or don't exist, who they're serving uh, and who they're not, and kind of where we see gaps based on what we know of uh, populations or not. Sometimes harder to reach is often, honestly, communities like the undocumented community because they're more reticent to engage, there are more fear or concerns, and they're less eligible for certain benefits um, that are available. So I think it sometimes it'll depend on what we're trying to do um, and what the initiative is, um, but uh, we, those are some of the factors that we take into consideration. One of the one of the other major areas of concern is the apparent disconnect between the, the data presented in the report and how it informs Moya's programs and activities. And mm -hmm. we're kind of trying to hit this in multiple ways. Um, but pursuant to Local Law 185 of 2017, Moya is required to provide information regarding the needs of the immigrant population, including but not limited to social services, legal services, housing, public benefits, education, and workforce development needs, and information regarding barriers faced by such population in accessing such services, and recommendations on how the city should address the barriers. The report provides data on the immigrant population which addresses some of these needs, but there's a lack of thorough analysis in Moya's report mm -hmm. and presentation of the policies and activities on the needs, the barriers faced, and how the city can address these barriers. Um, and so that, because we're just trying to figure out where it connects. Yep. And, and again, this is helpful. I think Margaret Chin said it best. I think we're all pointing to this idea that we're trying to, we're trying to figure out how to land a budget here. And we're, we're making assumptions that you're fighting inside with OMB. Um, I don't know how, how that works or not works, but, but we're fighting with OMB. And so we're trying to figure out how it connects. And on page 23 to 24, uh, on the report, Moya discusses linguistic isolation, stating 38.2% of the children in mixed status families live in a linguistically isolated household yep. in which all the adults in the household aged 14 or over speak a language other than English, and none speak English well. This suggests that children in the households may bear a disproportionate level of family responsibility as only proficient English speakers in the home. I'm sure all of you, and I, I I came from a family like this. Um, and the report does not discuss how Moya is working to combat this issue. And there's no strong data-informed argument laid out in the report to show that We Speak New York uh, program adequately combats the issue of child linguistic isolation in a meaningful way. This is just an example that we're trying to highlight mm -hmm. that really, I think, for us was the expectation of this local law and the reporting sure. about how we were supposed to get a better sense of information to make policy decisions, yep. not just to kind of tout work that's happening, but really understand the analysis, thorough analysis, to connect the dots. Yeah, so um, I think thank you for that. I will say a, f a couple of things. One is I think that's helpful to note, certainly in terms of how we think about the report going forward. Um, I think Secondly, is a kind of where I started, which is not, you know, to say uh, as an excuse, but a reality, which is that this is literally the second report that we're doing on this. So some of the ability to assess or ensure that you have on the other side the right data to make that assessment available just doesn't exist. So um, I think some of the questions of, like, how you address something this, frankly, uh, huge as an example, right, is requires on the other side an evaluation and an understanding of sort of existing dollars and programs and what their efficacy is in addressing this. So we have known that this is an issue. We share the council's uh, um, concern in the need and, uh, and addressing the need for uh, increased services in this area. Um, we uh, have commissioned in partnership with the Office for Workforce Development an evaluation through CUNY on the efficacy of the existing programs and the funding that's used to try and inform and better understand this. So I think, again, keeping in mind that you can't make a logical leap on the efficacy of a program without something on the other side that helps you do the evaluation um, and understand it. So the tools that I mentioned in that we use in the testimony, like evaluation, like survey, like focus groups, like reporting from fundees, like talking to community members, 
all of that informs are we making progress here or not? But the indicators that we provide are tremendously large. And so we have been sort of prioritizing and looking at the kinds of research and evaluation that we need to make, to draw some of the conclusions I think that you're asking, like what is working and what isn't. Um, and for uh, literacy, we did a We Speak evaluation. We commissioned a CUNY one for our system wide. We're working with DOE and new leadership that oversees its adult literacy work um, at looking more closely at that program, that programming, and how it works. And that will inform recommendations moving forward. Well, and I mean, I guess we can we can stay on We Speak and. I mean, just from reading the, the the kind of proposals, or not the proposals, the report, it sounds like a successful program. And really based on this idea that, that 5,000, on page 32, 5,320 L students were engaged. It's unclear about what engaged means exactly. And um, what does that mean? And how does this translate into, for instance, like a measurable level of improved English proficiency? Mm -hmm. Or what does it actually lead to, to more job opportunities? Yeah. Um, help us understand that. Sure. So um, engaged as students who have come to sort of one or more of the classes, right? So participated. Um, in some way with the classes themselves. It doesn't account for uh, visitors to the website, which is much greater than that. Um, and the website is a newer tool, right, that we're trying to, frankly, improve and make sure we can actually evaluate and understand who, who's using it and how. Um, and so we're looking at who's watching the videos for how long, who's using the, the tests or the tools for how long and kind of what that looks like. So that's an ongoing kind of area that we're looking at and trying to better understand. Um, so when we, what we have in this is, as I said, talking really about students who are part of the classes, one or more, I think, as is uh, not surprising. Um, most students complete the full, the full 10 weeks. Some, because of other commitments, either family or work, might not go to every single class, but may come to one or two, may receive the workbooks um, and access to the videos, and then uh, kind of continue their learning. I think that that information isn't here. Sorry, Commissioner. Just to, but like that that information isn't in, in the report, correct? In terms of defining students engaged, that's that's what I'm suggesting. But um, we can add. Yeah. Got it. Yep. Um, so I think in terms of kind of what people walk away from and what, what the learnings are, I think for us a lot of the learnings were around community-based models being effective because they allow for, they're oriented sort of around community and community spaces that people are inter-engaging inter in already, right, interacting with already. Um, and one of the learnings was that the l what they take from the classes, what they take from the videos, what they take from the workbooks, they're using within their homes. So they're sharing that information more mm -hmm. broadly with community, uh, sorry, with families and households. Um, and does that take you to job placement? Does that take you to uh, kind of workforce development? No, not necessarily, but in our mind, this is a spectrum and what we've heard consistently from uh, providers and advocates is the importance of ensuring that literacy, while it's a part of thinking around workforce, isn't valued solely for its uh, connection to workforce, that oftentimes maybe a stay-at-home mother or a new or arrival family member um, who is not engaged in the workforce and might not be engaged in the workforce the value of literacy for that individual shouldn't be measured by whether or not they see job placement as where they're finally going to end up. And we've certainly uh, absorbed and appreciated that viewpoint from community providers and mm. taken that into internal conversations in terms of valuing literacy and measuring its efficacy and the outcome. So for us, what we saw here in terms of uh, kind of household empowerment and building was as valuable as job placement, right? Um, but a part of the spectrum is looking at 
uh, all of it, right? And kind of how you make that connection. And that's that conversation is what we're undertaking with um, the new Office for Workforce Development and Amy Peterson now being at the head of it. This sounds like good information that the mayor should have. I hope you send that to him and talk to him about it. Uh, the Let's walk over to um, this idea of hard to reach populations and more specifically uh, the relationship that the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs has with the Sikh and the Punjabi speaking community. Sure. Uh, can you tell us first a little bit about what your relationship is with that community? Uh, that community and I think uh, the Mekong community uh, uh, NYC organization just submitted some testimony about Cambodians and Vietnamese uh, that have been coming to New York uh, since the 1980s in the Bronx. And these are re these are communities that kind of feel disconnected from mm -hmm. government and feel mm -hmm. a little bit invisible from mm -hmm. to government. And and tell me a little bit about the relationship with those communities and the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Sure, thank you. Um, I don't have sort of at my fingertips what we've done with these communities specifically, so we can certainly circle back to you, but I can start sort of top lines with what I'm aware of. So in terms of the Sikh and Punjabi community, we, um, we've we actually worked a lot in, on outreach and engagement with this community, but also understanding sort of what the community needs are. So um, by way of example, we've had IDNYC pop-up locations at Sikh temples, um, we have um, translated material, like more of the office materials into these languages through engagement with um, these communities. Um, we have been in partnership with our uh, Center for Faith and Community Partnerships and the Human Rights Commission, um, done annual celebrations for the Sikh community. Um, and uh, continued engagement. We actually do a lot of, we speak classes with um, some of the community-based organizations that serve these populations, um, at both in Brooklyn and in Queens. Uh, so sort of some examples of what we've done with the, those communities, but as I said, I don't have kind of the things at my fingertips and we can circle back with more specificity. In terms of Cambodian and Vietnamese communities, so I don't, I know, uh, sort of less off the top of my head what we've done with these populations, so would prefer to to circle back with more specificity um, so that I don't misrepresent anything. And maybe a, me a meeting with the organization just to kind of sit down. Yeah, we'd I know love they're that. ramping up for a lot of different projects, yep. and we're trying to hear from them on census projects in the future. Great. And trying to think about how we work with them, but maybe that would be a great first step too, yeah. uh, with you in your office. Um, and then you know, this is this is in the category of, of the report trying to be as um, as culturally sensitive as possible, and this is one example that we have um, learned about uh, that there are various references in the report to the Sikh community, and one of them states that the um, Vasaki is a celebration of the Sikh New Year. The so I'm referring to caption 35, page 35. Page 35, here it is. Uh, and that's the caption on the, on the, on the photo. Um, the Vasaki is not a Sikh New Year. And so we're, this is what I'm learning anyway. Um, how does Moya consult with communities? Here we're talking specifically with a, with a Sikh community. But how, how does Moya consult with organizations before it prints out statements? This happens in language translations. Sure. And, and and we're held at that standard at the city council level when we have district events yep. where we got to get stuff right. Yep. And that's in some ways our responsibility that we hold on our communication with communities, sure. especially communities that are in, you're at city le level, citywide level. And so that kind of just tells us that there might be a disconnect uh, with communities. Yeah. And so how do we, one, address that? And what are you doing in cons consultation with communities so that so we're, we're, we're building the best kind of uh, sensitivity where we where we can you know we can't change federal government policies but we can we can think about this this is where we can spend a lot of time building relationships with communities so that we get stuff like this right sure so thank you for that so um, we have done these events as I said and I think it's captioned in one of the photos with CCHR and CAU we don't 
do these events without consultation with the community-based organizations and participation um, and fr frankly sponsorship, including this year of multiple community representatives and organizations. This year, in fact, we had one at the um, uh, NYU Kimmel Center with a new uh, mayor of Hoboken who actually came and spoke to the audience. Um, and so I don't, you know, I think in terms of uh, sort of how we talk about or characterize events, it is very much a collaboration, not just from the agency side, but with community partners and individuals. Um, I think certainly we'll go back and ensure that we're characterizing things um, effectively or correct uh, errors that might not be accurate, but um, all of that is done uh, in, we don't do we don't literally do a single event without a community <laughs> collaboration or sponsorship. Well, and I guess for this one, if, if you can, you work with us uh, to ensure that we can correct a mistake on yeah, the report, of course. and that we just keep moving forward to figure out how how, how we can double check these things sure. again. They're this is this is a living. So I'm going to. Oh, actually, there's one more question before I kind of wrap up. I want to say thank you for your patience. Those who are still here. And uh, we want to hear from you and your, your report analysis as well. Um, the, the recommendations at the end, uh, one of the, the first, actually, the first recommendation is to lower barriers for immigrant access to services. Can you explain? Um, well, that, that's a big, that's, that's beautiful, right? I love hearing that. And you may know where <laughs> this is coming. So we want to lower barriers for immigrant access to services. And that's, I'm assuming, everything, healthcare, yep. education, yep. and legal as well. Yep. And so this falls into contradiction with the detainer law carve out in the legal services contracts. And expanding the detainer law by rules serves, that, that, that you served, um, or that the mayor did anyway. Um, and this, this falls into con contradiction with this recommendation. I don't know if you have any more, but I'm just kind of pointing out that your own recommendation kind of really speaks to barriers being removed and the mayor just keeps adding more barriers to this. Um, and I'm not saying it's you, but I am saying it is your boss that is doing this. If you have an, op an opportunity to talk about that, that'd be great. And it might not be much, but I'm giving you the opportunity to do that. Sure. Um, I, I'll say a couple things somewhat indirectly. So um, I, I think certainly from uh, the perspective of the priorities for our office, you see them laid out. And obviously, uh, this report um, is supported by the mayor. It is. It includes a letter from the mayor yeah, at the beginning the of the report. Um, and, you know, uh, for what it's worth, none of the work of the office is possible without the support of the mayor and the administration as a whole. So um, I think that's important for me certainly to know and for folks to understand. I think um, we've seen the you know single largest investment in immigration legal services in the entire country in our city in the last uh, six years. And we've seen an annual increase in that investment um, every single year. And so certainly that's uh, credit to many, many people, <laughs> um, and not just the mayor, but I think wouldn't happen if there wasn't a commitment to uh, doing what this says as well. And I think there are certainly differences of opinions on where some lines are struck. Um, but I think the principle of our recommendation here is shared by everybody. Uh, in the interest of time, we're going to put the rest of the questions on a letter that we'll send over to Moya for response. And we want to hear from some of the advocates that are here today. And I want to close by, by saying that I think you, you've, you've kind of heard the overarching themes here. And I want to just restate them. Um, that there is a lot of alignment between the city council and your office. And, and I think that that's important to lift up and in conversations yeah. like this that have been, I think, difficult for, for me. Um, because I feel like this report has not, has not met the standards that we are expecting. Uh, the local laws really, I think, laid it out. And so I want to explore legislation to help, help craft the messaging around the, the report. 
that really focuses on, on data, but not just data, because it sounds like you have some of that data, but it's, it's like simple stuff every, every, and this is maybe just the, my college like training. Uh, I did study physics uh, as, a, as a college student. You did? I did, I know. Wow. I, I was a college <laughs> major, <laughs> a, and co or physics major, and then I moved over to okay. politics and performing arts. All right. Uh, we could talk about that yeah, later. Yeah, please. Uh, <laughs> but the charts don't have any, none of the charts have, have citations. And, and so just little things that I think have been, have been difficult for, for me to kind of go through the report has been, has been disappointing. Yeah. Uh, and, but I know that we can do better, and we will. And we're going to work together to make that happen. And we've given you some senses about how, how to professionalize this in a way that we can all feel very proud of because we're doing some really good work. And then there's some places that are really sticky, like the carve out, that are just contradictions. And then, and then, you know, your boss is running for president right now. And what is really difficult for us is to figure out how much of this report is just something so that we can kind of show people that we're doing good things for kind of campaign style light information. And, and I don't know if that's true, and I don't want that to be true, so we want to make sure that we can step away from that vortex of politics and just be factual about everything that we're doing so that we can build budgets that are good budgets and and fight OMB. Whether or not you're able to do that at that table, I don't I don't know, but we are. And we're fighting uh, the Office of Management and Budget every day for more funds, for more services. Um, so, um, and that also includes this concept of duplicating reports elsewhere. The buck stops with you, Commissioner. You are the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. All things immigrants need to come to you and through this annual report. I don't want to have to go search somewhere else for information that impacts immigrants. I want it all to be here. This is where it needs to belong uh, so that we can all see it together and make analysis together. That's the interest of the law so that we can have one place for everything. And so I'm really charging you to collect all the different pieces and not, allow, not ask us as New Yorkers, especially as, as a chair of this committee, to go elsewhere to find data. This all belongs and should belong here. And belong over there too as well. DOH can do their things, but they, can all, they should all be here so that we can have one place. Um, I, think, I think that's it for me. Uh, thank you for being here today with your team. Thank you for all the work. I know you're doing a lot of good work, uh, but we're gonna do better, and we'll do that together. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're gonna go to our first panel. Thank you so much again for, for being here. Uh, the Asian American Federation, Tiffany Chang. Uh, Joanne Yu, uh, the Asian American Federation, the African Communities Together, Amaha Casa, um, and then also uh, Maimuna Diei from the African Communities Together. And I think that's it. If you're still here, we'd love to hear from you. And then when everyone kind of settles down, or settles in, I should say, uh, we just want to make sure that we have a Moya representative here throughout the rest of the hearing. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, when you're ready. Uh, make sure that it's red, sure. red. Uh, the light. Yeah. There All we right. go, All it's right. hot. Uh, thank you, Chairman Menchaca. My name is Amaha Kasa. I'm the Executive Director of African Communities Together. Um, I'm gonna cede to my colleague, Maimuna Jay, to speak on our behalf, but wanted to be available for any questions or follow-up. Hi, everyone. My name is Maimuna, Program Manager at African Communities Together, in charge of our language access work. So good, good afternoon, Chairman Menchaka and members of the Committee on Immigration, and thank you for convening this um, hearing today. Again, my name is Maimuna, Program Manager at African Communities Together, um, ACT. So at ACT, I lead our Community Interpreter Program, 
and supervise the development of our African language services worker cooperative. Um, African Communities Together is an organization of African immigrants that empowers our community members to integrate socially, get ahead economically, and engage civically. Moya's annual report states that one of the uh, three main priorities is to combat inequalities that harm New York, um, New York immigrants communities. And one of their recommendations um, for fiscal year to 2019 is to lower barriers for immigrants to access services. So one of the uh, most significant barriers for immigrant communities in accessing services is language. Um, language barriers are particularly significant for communities that speak languages of limited um, diffusion, LLDs. LLDs uh, include most African languages, many Asian languages, and indig indigenous Latin American languages. Speakers of LLDs are often hard to reach communities who are most disconnected from um, immigration services and outreach while also being the most targeted by the federal uh, immigration policies that Moya discusses in its report, such as the termination of temporary protected status, TPS, rest restrictions on asylum and escalating immigration enforcement. The city provides uh, tens of millions of dollars in funding to nonprofit immigration legal service providers through Action NYC and other city initiatives. Currently, language access is a ma major barrier to successful delivery of these services. Attorneys at city funded nonprofit immigration legal service providers spend too much tr time trying to find and screen professional and reliable interpreters for LLDs, particularly in high stakes cases like deportation and asylum taking scarce attorney hours and legal services budgets away from legal representation. Both city agencies and city-funded nonprofit agencies depend heavily on, on telephonic interpretation, and telephonic interpretation services less effective than in-person interpretation at building trust and rapport between attorneys and clients, and, and there are often significant issues of quality and availability of interpretation for LLDs. In addition, telephonic services are expensive as much as um, $100 per hour. Our members are often asked to bring their own interpreters to an appointment, and our organization is often asked, asked to provide volunteer interpreters to city agencies and city-funded nonprofit service providers, and our office often receives calls from uh, new immigrant members who are unable to access services because of language barriers. So our recommendations are, um, while these issues are particularly ac acute in relation to immigration legal services, they cut across city-funded services, including education, health care, housing, and social services. Creating truly inclusive language access to immigrant New Yorkers would require a comprehensive approach. At present, Moya has not proposed such a sy systemic approach. So for this reason, ACT joined with New York Immigration Coalition, Asian American Federation, and MASA in the South Bronx in a coalition to to advocate for language access for the African, Asian, and Latino communities we serve. Our coalition is proposing two critical initiatives to lower barriers for immigrants to access services. So the first one is being, uh, the first one is the creation of a community legal interpreter bank that recruits, trains, and dispatches legal interpreters who provide services free of cost to city-funded nonprofit legal service providers. The second one is the development of a language service workers-owned cooperatives, um, community-based worker-owned agencies that build the pipeline of trained language services professionals while creating skilled employment and business ownership op opportunities for New York immigrants um, communities. So we applaud the city council for its response to the 2020 pre uh, preliminary budget, which calls on the administration to allocate $2 million in the fiscal 2020 executive budget to pilot a language interpreter bank. And we also thank Chairman Mencheka um, in particular for his advocacy for the language bank. As the city council continue to negotiate the budget, we urge you all members of the committee on immigration to continue your advocacy with the mayor to fund language access expansion in the 2020 executive budget and to work with our coalition to address language access needs for New York's most vulnerable populations. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm going to have to start to come to more of these hearings as I'm finding all these interesting facts out about I you. Know. <laughs> this is I know. I have a lot, by the way. This I have is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, good afternoon. My name is Joanne Yu, and I'm the executive director of the Asian American Federation. Um, we are here in solidarity with uh, African communities together. I think we talk about you know having fa immigrant families bring their own interpreter, and I think I've shared with you before that I was one of those kids. Um, and having been in, you know, having been in this country and being a citizen, you know, over 40 years, 
it's shocking that this is continuing to happen. And I think the level of translations that um, our, the immigrant community needs, uh, especially this time, having to combat all of these really draconian policies coming out of the Trump White, White House, and, it, and you know, having, having our children interpret for our parents is really unconscionable. And I think the other shocking thing is that, you know, we all agree, I, I think I see a lot of friends here you know, we've had, you know, we've laughed and said, like, sometimes these translation services would be better served by Google Translate. And so, you know, we are really, uh, we have been working together very much, uh, very closely around the whole, uh, the Legal Interpreter Bank, um, looking at opportunities for us to support um, the community legal, uh, the, the language cooperative. Um, but I also want to raise a few other issues that I think our community, our city needs to be aware of, um, you know, that, you saw the report from uh, uh, Comptroller Stringer that the Asian American community has some of the highest rates of deportation cases happening. Um, I think that's partly due to the fact that like there hasn't been significant investments made in the immigration legal services in the Asian American community. And so we're gonna raise, we wanna raise this uh, issue uh, with you. Also, you know, we're any day now we're expecting the, the Trump rule on public charge. What does that mean for our communities? I think there is, I, I think the city had shared some statistics at a, at a town hall we had, and they're saying that, you know, Asian American community is, is not, uh, is choosing to not enroll at eight times the rate of other communities. And I think those are really st scary statistics, statistics to us. So I think um, this time, you know, you know, my concern isn't, you know, it happens to be, well, what happens to all those folks who are not re-enrolling? Because how will they eat? How will they have a roof over their heads? And how will they get medical assistance? So I think something that I want to put on the council and ask for your assistance, you know, is there an opportunity for the council to take the leadership to be able to convene some kind of a working group where we figure out what the plan is going to look like, it, you know, when the, when the policy comes down? Because I think the reality is that the damage is done. You know, whether whatever the policy is, people are choosing not choosing to opt out. And I think there's this is really scary time for vulnerable people and finally one of the you know we're all looking at the census um, Howard usually that usually does these uh, testimonies but Howard is with the Census Bureau right now uh, you know at a conference and he texted me this morning and something that uh, he told me that I think you know about the census has is not going to put any money into uh, media for South Asian communities uh, throughout the country so what does that what does that mean for um, the, you know, the Indian, the, you know, the, all of the South Asian communities who are not going to be able to get information in the census. So is there an opportunity for the council to be able to uh, close the gap in the city to ensure that um, everybody in New York is aware of the census and they are not afraid to participate? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's it. Okay, I have questions and comments and um, maybe some more revelations. We'll see if, I, if I'm inspired. <laughs> Um, I want to start with the interpreter bank. Uh, so essentially, that's an idea that has been so inspiring and like a seed has grown into this blossoming bouquet of flowers in my head. And then I think the heart of a lot of people that we're talking to. And so just thank you for that because this, this is an idea that is not a new idea but could be transformed by the energy of a New York City and the funds of a New York City at a $2 million rate. So I really want to talk a little bit about this in terms of what it would help me sell this concept. We are in the middle of budget negotiations right now. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not a secret that it, it ended up in our negotiations, budget ne or um, our budget response. And so tell me, tell me about the Legal Interpreter Bank, how, how, it, how it launches, how it impacts census, uh, it, could, it, it could impact census and the interpretation is that we need. Joanne, you talked about who, how do we go to our communities? Well, does the language bank, the interpreter bank, the legal interpreter bank help do that uh, with the worker cooperative around um, trained language service professionals? So give me, give me that, that sense uh, so that we, one, it's on record and that the people can hear it, but that, that can really just make this point clear. I'll, I'll dive in on that to start with. Um, so, I mean, I think, uh, at, like you, um, Chairman Menchaca, we've been sort of inspired by the success of this model other places, and, you know, good good artists steal from the best, right? Um, and so, um, you know, our proposal uh, 
was initially that the interpreter bank focus on provision of immigration legal services. Um, just as sort of a piloting, you know, sort of to, to, um, uh, to, to give us a place to start. Um, and as my colleague pointed out, you know, the city is already putting tens of millions of dollars into immigration legal services, and one of the key bottlenecks is immigration um, is is skilled, culturally competent um, interpretation and translation for immigration legal services. Um, and so, in order to recoup some of this investment, and you say, saying, how do we sell this, right? We're already spending this money, it's just being spent badly, right? It's going to immigration legal service providers who are not specialists in recruiting, training, and managing uh, immigra you know, interpreters, and should not have to be, right? They should really be spending their time preparing their clients for their asylum hearings, or you know, filing motions to, to keep them from, from being deported. Um, if we centralize uh, these services, it en enables us to have greater transparency, um, where we know what languages are we are, are being demanded most often, how much are we spending. Um, you know, $180 an hour is is you know is not an unusual rate for telephonic services. Um, with that at, at that at that amount, you can get you can put a lot of money in individual skilled professional interpreters projects if you're not also putting pu money in the pockets of these sort of uh, big agencies. Um, so I think those are those are some of the arguments. Um, I think what's been informative about engaging with you, with the um, with the council, and and uh, and and, uh, and you know to some extent with the mayor's office, is that people see the need as being even greater um, than immigration legal services. Um, you know, so the questions have been census: How do we use this to reach language isolated communities? Um, social services, education, so forth. Um, I think we envisioned that around the co-ops. We hadn't necessarily envisioned that. Ar envision that around the interpreter bank, but I think the potential is there, um, and it's it's just a question of of um, you know the resources to to get that off the ground and going. Um, I think the speaker in in, in his response uh, to the executive budget um, put forward the idea of in addition to African languages, indigenous Latin and uh, Latinx languages, and uh, Asian languages, um, a American Sign Language, um, which is something that the Community Legal Interpreter Bank in D.C. has provided, um, and we know he has a, you know, the speaker has a big commitment to, to uh, disability access, and so we think that's an exciting concept, so I think that there's a lot to build on, um, but we kind of need to start somewhere, and we're hoping that'll happen in this year's budget. And the language service worker cooperatives, is that, how is that connected to the Legal Interpreter Bank? Well, we have an infographic, um, oh, I love <laughs> because, pictures. because we got that question. Um, uh, a fair Does amount. it have a citation on it? Uh, it <laughs> um, nope, okay. <laughs> but we can work on that. We can work on um, that. Uh, but uh, we, we and and we didn't bring twenty five copies of this, but we can share the copies that we have. Yes, absolutely. Um, we have a couple more we can share. Okay. Uh, so the idea is that the um, that the language co ops can. Um, relate to the Legal Interpreter Bank in a couple ways. Um, one is co-op interpreters could work for both, right? Um, they, the, 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 the Legal Interpreter Bank um, could, uh, you, know, you know, employ co uh, um, employ interpreters who also work for the co-op, and then the co-ops provide services beyond immigration legal, um, to even to the pri even to private sector organizations, hospitals, education, social services, city funded or not. Um, another model I that um, the CLIB in DC has used is one of subcontracting. Um, a lot of services they have in-house, but when they have specialized need, including all of their ASL, um, they actually subcontract to other agencies. So either or both, um, you know, get, we get into some questions around city contracting rules and you know what what, what would work. Um, although we are proposing that the CLIB be based in an independent um, uh, not-for-profit agency, in part so that they can attract other revenue streams, whether that's private funding, state funding, um, uh, charitable funding, and so forth. And one question that I got from many council members about the idea was hospitals. Uh, have rules on information and who can be in the room. Uh, how are those, and, and in courts as well, uh, mm -hmm. they take sworn uh, oaths. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about how those things are not issues in terms of the co-ops, the, the worker cooperatives and the bank itself, the interpreter bank? Yep. Um, so I think, it, it, I think uh, 
there, part of the goal is to provide a baseline um, of, uh, of some skills that are, that are broadly applicable to all interpreters and translators, right? Um, there's, a, there's frankly a, a little bit of a lack of a unified standard around interpretation. There are standards, um, you know, the, the New York State courts have their standards. There's some standards within the healthcare setting. Um, so, but things like training on professional ethics, um, training on how, how to manage um, uh, situations where, you know, where there's a misunderstanding or a lack of uh, communication between the provider and the client. Um, those things are universal. Um, the co-ops can actually be a vehicle for people to get uh, more advanced professional training and certification in things like le uh, in, in legal, um, in healthcare, and in other settings. Um, we don't necessarily think that everyone who is in the co-ops is going to be able to translate at every level um, right away. Um, but the point of all of this, and I, I will underscore, you know, I think it's an issue for all our communities, but um, talking to MASA and to other organizations, indigenous Latin American languages are, you know, are really in a, cri a crisis of access, right? Um, it's going to really take building a pipeline um, and a place where, f you know, we can centralize things like training, um, um, and in some cases that's basic uh, English language proficiency and fluency um, in order to get people to where uh, they, they can be professional translators, um, interpreters and translators. Um, so that's what, so we're trying to build the pipeline um, and, and I think when we, our budget proposal, some of the key costs are bringing in um, the training resources, the training is, and, and then also covering the cost of people for professional certification. So the two million would cover both the, the, the bank, the interpreter bank and the worker cooperative uh, build out? Yeah, the, the total proposal for this is, is $3 million, but like we said, we think this is something that um, can attract multiple revenue streams, um, uh, you know, including the state and including private funders. Um, I think, uh, you know, we would, there, we would need to be some engagement as to how that council recommendation of $2 million breaks out between the co-ops and the community legal interpreter bank. But the biggest single line item in both, I mean, there's staffing and training and those costs. The biggest single a a line item, particularly on the CLIB, is actually the paid hours of interpretation, right? You know, if we pay someone $50 an hour, um, uh, you know, which again is still significantly less than we're paying some of these telephonic service providers, how many hours of interpretation can we buy so that when, you know, uh, you know, a city funded immigration legal service provider needs a Aromo or Kichwa or, you know, um, or, or um, Hmong translator for uh, interpreter for next week, they can apply and know that that's going to be provided by the interpreter bank. Got it. Um, I can talk forever on this. I'm going to pause here and just say thank you for, for the questions. I have enough to go back. I don't know what's going to happen with the budget. I have to say that. Um, I don't know. I hope. I hope I'm going to fight really hard, and it's not just me. I think a lot of people are really excited about this, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, that's non-committal. <laughs> um, but the work that's happening in the uh, in the report, the annual report, or the work, the intentions maybe uh, on page 42, the report, the annual report says that it's expanded and deepened legal service provisions to Chinese, Korean. And South Asian serving organizations and communities. Um, it doesn't sound like that's happened, and and so I want to get a sense from you about whether or not there's been Moya outreach that's uh, been expanded. Because sure. it's one thing to say it's expanded, yeah, but we need more, or there's been no expansion. We haven't felt it, and I think the commissioner has made a lot of efforts to expand um, outreach and just to get you know, if anything, just to get the information out there, right, to people about their rights and what is happening. Um, but I think I think the reality is that there isn't a nonprofit organization that, you know, uh, serves in language in our in my community, and so I think that's a huge challenge. I think we often, you know, this is where the language bank idea comes from. Like, how do we have to borrow, you know, borrow skills to be able to explain. And now more than ever, um, I think you know, for the last four years, the federation has been trying to build a nonprofit organization that will serve the Asian American immigration legal services in language, and I think that's really critical. And I think, um, you know, I think Moya does a great job, um, but I think we can always do better, especially now uh, with all of the policies that are happening. So, you know, we continue to work with the commission, with Moya, and talk to the commissioner regularly and um, present ideas, and they've been very receptive. Uh, but, you know, you, you build on the good work that you're doing by being even better. 
I couldn't um, agree more. Uh, so last question is, um, well, actually, I'll, I'll start with a little bit of a, a revelation. So I'm thinking about language, too, and not in terms of legal services or whatever, but uh, yoga. So I, I just got certified as a 200-hour um, yoga trainee. Another fun fact, uh, like, a month, like a week ago, a week and a half ago. And there's nothing in Spanish. And I want to bring yoga to Spanish-speaking folks uh, in my work. So I'm putting a call out right now if anybody's a Spanish yoga teacher. And so these are, these are things and access points. And then I think about young people like us, Joanne, and I'll, I'll probably all of you in our, all the things that we just talked about, certifications, understanding hospitals and how they work. Right now, young kids are doing that in communities. We did that for our parents. Um, and that's not okay. And look at all the, all the millions of dollars that have to go to do the training. That's what we're talking about. That's the gap of, 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 of um, access issues between a service and a family, and all of this is being on the on, is a burden on young people in our in our communities and our mixed status families. And I think it's really a health crisis. I mean, it's a crisis because you know, as a nine year old kid, you know, I didn't have the vocabulary to translate for certain issues, medical insur medical issues, oh, yeah. legal issues. So if you don't have a vocabulary, how do you explain that to a professional to be able to get treatment? So I think the kid the fact that our kids are serving as serving in that role and and having to explain things that they don't even know what means, I think that's really dangerous. Yep. And then put the fear on top of the constant we're gonna see public charge, the Supreme Court's gonna figure out their situation on the or their question on the census question, um uh, citizenship question. And so yes to convening a working group. I think it's a great idea. We want to do that as soon as possible and come together. And we can convene that at the city council and ask the mayor's office to come with advocates to figure out how we're going to do this. Um, because I don't think that there's a plan. And we need one. And we need one now. Uh, okay, I think that's it for us now. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next panel, we have the immigrant uh, Immigrant Justice, Justice Corps, Jojo um, Annabel, uh, Hassan uh, Shafakia uh, from the Legal Aid Society, and then we have Cindy uh, Nesbitt from the Sikh Coalition. George, you want to start? Sure. I was, I was going to give the, the first voice, but um, I think I can give it. <laughs> so um, good afternoon. My name is George Wannabill. I'm the Executive Director of Immigrant Justice Corps. And um, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to comment on Moyer's annual report, 2019 annual report. Um, I think, first of all, what I would say is that we've worked very closely with Moya in terms of some of the work they've done in immigration. We happen to share space with them in community-based uh, community organizations, Arab American Association of New York City, uh, where because of our infusion of fellows into that community-based organization, we were able to get um, funding from Moya to put in navigators, and in a couple, of probably two years, became the largest seven um, legal service provider or community-based uh, provider in South Brooklyn. So a lot of work has been done when we talk about underserved communities and where people are not going. Uh, we've served with Moya in libraries. We have fellows in all the libraries where they are there four days a week. Um, Moya supplements that with naturalization clinics and help desks. Uh, we are in some of the um, African communities trying to build up on some of those areas. We, we have the Chinese Planning Council, Moya is also there. So in that respect, we've, I think you see a lot of progress in terms of um, providing services in underserved communities. Uh, we've also reached out, we, we serve the Korean community, so does Moya, serve the Chinese community, so does Moya. But definitely there are gaps, and I think there are gaps where you look at, there's a navigation, uh, navigators program, 
but is it possible for us to move into community navigators? Have probably more navigators in communities who can impart information, do know your rights in, um, in communities, come up with, be able to surface problems that are happening in community. So for example, in South Brooklyn, where you have the Arab community, where there are a lot of um, USCIS um, uh, policy issues that affect them, but it's very difficult for them usually sometimes to access uh, legal services, right? And so trying to work on those. Is it also possible to think about community mental health clinics? Because what we're seeing right now is a lot of fear and anxiety. How do you explain to a kid whose parent is in removal proceedings what is going on? How do you talk to a child like that? How do we educate uh, some of our, uh, our parents to talk to children about some of the things that are going on? How do you explain some of the fear? The fear that if I go to school and I come back home, probably my parents will not be here. How do we do that? We don't have that. And if, if there's a need for that, which would also inform some of the work as legal service providers we do. So I think those two are my two comments in terms of gaps. So thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Hassan Shafiqullah. I'm the attorney in charge of the Immigration Unit at the Legal Aid Society, and thank you for holding this hearing. Um, I do want to give a shout out to Moya and to HRA for some, some things that they did really well. And part of this is a result of hearings that this committee held um, late last year around the Immigrant Opportunities Initiative in particular. We had um, asked the city to reconsider limitations on funding, particularly in two areas under IOI, the, what's, what's called the stacking cap, not paying us when we're doing multiple forms of relief for a given client. And going into fiscal 20, they've reconsidered that, and the stacking cap is off. And so that's a great development. And also the re-enrollment cap. Um, previously, there was a limitation on the number of years you can get paid for work we're doing on a case. But given that they're asking us to do complex cases that take multiple years, it didn't make sense for them to limit funding. And they've re removed that cap as well. So, so two great things. Um, in terms of reaching communities that haven't that they're underserved, um, the city has also um, allowed us to expand IOI outreach in fiscal 20 onward into um, to two new organizations that are legal aid is partnering with, um, African Services Committee and the Chinese American Planning Council. So we're excited about that as well. Um, for public charge, we know that the city is preparing and, and gearing up for this rule to drop and we recognize the work that they have been doing in preparation, but two recommendations for Moya around public charge in particular. One, to take a more direct role in preparing frontline agency staff, particularly um, staff at agencies like HRA that are administering these benefits to make sure that they're capturing clients who might be either disenrolling or um, just afraid to enroll in the first place because of the chilling effect of the rule, even right now, and making sure that that sort of training is happening, and we're not sure that it is. Um, and the second thing to think about what sort of alternative sources of assistance there might be for people who are afraid to receive benefits because of public charge and admissibility grounds? Are there ways to um, have, whether self-insurance or cash assistance funded by you know, private foundations or whatever it is so that folks who desperately need these services um, can get them without triggering um, this inadmissibility ground because those benefits are, are government-based? In terms of being in a budget season, just to switch, base, uh, switch gears a little bit, um, on behalf of not just the Legal Aid Society, but also Brooklyn Defenders and Bronx Defenders, um, urging the city, both the city council and, and the mayor's office, to increase funding for NIFOP, given all the challenges that are happening in detention. With the increased dockets, with video teleconferencing, with the advancing of court dates without advance notice, there's been about 230 to 250 recent arrivals from the border, and we're dealing with those. You may have heard there's a mumps outbreak in Bergen County, and so four of the units are under lockdown right now. The, uh, the challenges are across the board. And also, as we asked before, um, funding for increasing our, our federal work um, to be able to do habeas and the other sorts of um, cases that, um, that folks in detention need. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, good afternoon. My name is Cindy Nesbitt. I'm a senior staff attorney with the Sick Coalition. Next to me is my colleague, Assis Kaur, and she's available to answer any questions you may have that are community-based. Um, the Sick Coalition is a nonprofit, nonpartisan national organization that deals with civil rights within the Sikh community. Um, one of the big issues that we wanted to address was with language access. Um, we appreciate the city's efforts to provide language access to immigrant communities, but we think it's really important to continue to expand those services, um, particularly when we're talking about languages that aren't in the top 10 foreign language languages spoken. Um, when we're talking about these community members, they're often the, um, the most vulnerable. For instance, when you think of the Sikh community, um, they have an outside facing uniform, so they're very distinguishable. Uh, they have unshorn hair, and many of many members in the community wear turbans, so they are disproportionately um, looked at and discriminated against. And so when they don't have access to language services, that really impacts them. They don't understand their rights. They don't understand how to file a complaint. They don't understand um, how to request services. And another thing that's really important is when we're talking about language access, it's not enough to just have interpreters. It's really important, and we understand this because we've been dealing a little bit with the federal government with the ICE issue. Um, and I, I hope that the city's services are somewhat better, but I imagine some of the issues are similar. When you're talking about a country like, for instance, India, you have three major languages, Hindi, Urdu, and Punjabi. And while the person may speak all three sort of reasonably well, the likelihood is that they're only truly competent in one of those languages. And so when you have someone who says, well, yes, I'm a native Urdu speaker, but I can speak Punjabi, perhaps those language services aren't as great as they should be. And we're talking about issues like you know, presenting an immigration case or another legal case or medical issues. It is essential that they're able to communicate effectively in their language. Um, that's not always true of the interpreters and the translators provided. Um, another issue is that when the city is engaging with immigrant communities, it's really, really important that the organizers understand the community they're serving. So for instance, with the Sikh community, many wear turbans, many wear kirpan, and for those of you who aren't aware, a kirpan is um, an object that looks similar to a knife, but it is in fact a religious article of faith. And so when the city is planning events to celebrate that community or to provide important information, for instance, all the immigration immigration, uh, immigration information the city's been providing. It's really important that the city understands those cultural aspects so that members of the community are in fact attending because a person who can't wear his article of faith is not going to attend an event celebrating his community or providing essential information to that community. Um, and the last thing I wanted to address just briefly is that it's really important for the city to also have a way for um, the NYPD to communicate with organizations like the Taxi and Limousine Service. And I bring the TLC up because so many taxi drivers are within the immigrant community. So we need to have a better way to interact so that the, the city understands the concerns of those community members um, for things like safety issues. I know right now the uh, one of the, the major issues in, or one of the, the issues in the Moya report addressed taxi drivers' financial stability, which is, of course, very important. But the safety aspects are also really important. Many taxi drivers are required to choose between <coughs> either having that plexiglass barrier or um, a camera. That's not necessarily adequate for a lot of these people who are targeted for, for crimes. Um, and Assis, I think, wanted to address briefly some of the Moya issues as well. Um, just touching back on the question you had asked previously to the commission about the caption on page 35. Um, although the SIC Coalition did collaborate with CCHR, MOYA, and other um, comptroller office and some of the other agencies in the city to um, put together the event, um, I can confirm that we were not consulted about um, this report or that caption in particular. So I, I feel those are two distinctions that need to be made. We all work together on the event, but um, seeing the report in its entirety was our first time seeing it, so we were not consulted or we didn't review the report. Thank you, and, and I, we wanted to have the opportunity to for you to talk a little bit about that, and uh, we definitely want to make sure that gets corrected, um, really across the board on anything that happens. Mm -hmm. um, 
in terms of print or even um, how how we celebrate and these are the events themselves uh, that and this is partly to your point which is allowing for events to be holistic in terms of sensitivity and also uh, awareness for actual crowd building making sure that people feel like they can come and represent their their culture their religion um, whatever whatever uh, uh, is part of their identity, and for immigrant communities, it's gonna it's gonna range, and mm -hmm. so we we hear that. So thanks for confirming that, yeah. um, and then also the request for us is for them to to change it. Yes, um, and you know, speaking a little bit more about the Vasaki event, there the huge reason why it was at Kimmel Center and not a city building had to do with religious accommodations. Last year, when it was the first ever event. It was at, um, I want to say, one of the buildings on Center Street nearby here. Um, but this year, we wanted to kind of bypass the security issues, so we chose a location where um, community members would not need to request for accommodations or we wouldn't have to deal with it, the city wouldn't have to deal with it. Um, so even as other events, even if they're not sick specific events, but you're trying to bring together many different communities um, thinking of DCAS or any of the other, you know, city um, security personnel type might be there. It's important to remember that, you know, even downstairs, like, I alarm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, to think that it will discourage community members from showing up if they know they'll have to, like, sometimes in their broken English, have to explain what their articles of faith are. Right. we got to solve that. Yeah. <laughs> our city our city spaces cannot be... Um, barriers themselves to, to access services. Uh, and we want to work with you to figure out how, how we can do that. Uh, I want to just really quickly go through um, a train of thought here. So we're talking about mental health clinics in our communities, and we're thinking about Thrive and YC and what they've been able to do, and that's been a conversation in our budget hearings. So I'm hoping that we can come back after this budget is over and figure out where there are whatever's left of Thrive um, and other mental health services that we figure out a way to solve some of these issues around mental health and bringing to community clinics um, and, and really thinking about navigators in terms of how everything gets connected. Um, Legal Aid is now partnering with CPC to build out that effort to bring legal resources to communities. And really what I'm hearing from Joanne and some others is that we need, we need a new organization that can, that can really focus and um, present legal services to, the, to uh, specifically uh, Asian populations. And so I'm wondering if there's anything that, that legal aid has been in talks with um, uh, either the Federation or about that, because I really want to tease that out a little bit more in, in terms of what legal aid thinks that that um, need is all about. The need or are they two different needs? Sure. So our involvement with CPC and with African Services Committee will start in the coming fiscal year, and so that's something that none of us have seen yet. We're, we'll see how it plays out on the ground. And as it plays out, if it meets their needs, and if not, then we should talk about how to, how to do it better. Okay, great. I, I, can, I can speak to that a bit because we've had some discussions with them. And the way we are looking at it is how you're using um, college graduates who are passionate about doing immigration work, which is our community fellow program, to be able to um, help them do that. Because the way we recruit is to bring in college graduates who actually speak the language of the various neighbor neighborhoods. And so we've had that kind of preliminary discussion with them as to how best to do it. All our fellows who are working at Chinese Foreign Council are Mandarin speakers. Our fellows working at Arab American are Arab speakers. So that is how we look at bridging that gap, and we look at our community fellows as frontline um, folks who meet people for the first time, and if they are not able to take on some of the cases they present, it's basically um, uh, referred to our lawyers who are the justice fellows. Got it. Well, we should check in, like the first quarter, 
and just have an informal discussion about how things are going, if that's, if that's adequate. Whenever you feel like there's an opportunity to report, that'd be great to kind of get a sense of it as we figure out the, the gap in services. And then I totally appreciate also the, the, the good work that uh, Moya and HRA have done to help solve some of these things. And those are discussions that we've had in this setting where we have a pu good public hearing, where we identify gaps and issues, they go back to work and they come back and they say, great, we heard you, we're gonna change. And so I totally support that and I wanna thank and appreciate them as well. Okay, I think that's it for, for, for us now, thank you. Next, we have uh, Gregory Copeland uh, from the NSC Community Legal Defense. Sarah Gilmo from um, also from the organization, Rex Chen from Legal Services, and then Menu Selvin from the Malik Law Firm. Is there anyone else that has signed up but has not been called? This might be our last panel, so I want to make sure. Have you not been called yet? Um, did you fill out a, a form? You did. Uh, come on up and let's get you a seat, and then. When you introduce yourself, we'll make sure that if we don't have your sheet, that we'll have you sign in. Or let's just give her another one, just in case we don't have it. Yeah, you could just pull up another chair. We'll get you up here. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Sarah? Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Menchaca, and thank you for the opportunity uh, for us to testify regarding Moya's report. My name is Sarah Gilman. I'm one of the co-legal directors of NSC Community Legal Defense. My fellow co-legal director is here, Gregory Copeland. We make up the entire organization. Um, NSC <laughs> is a new and innovative legal services organization led by Gregory and myself. Um, we're focused on addressing the current uh, unmet needs um, in a flexible and rapid way that can respond to the ever-changing attacks on our immigrant community. Um, and the increased enforcement, um, unfortunately, efforts by the Trump administration. The Moria report demonstrates the extraordinary commitment of the city of New York and its legal services providers to serving our immigrant community members. At the same time, it highlights the need for expanded investment and in new initiatives addressing rapid response needs and gaps in truly facilitating, facilitating universal access to justice for non-citizen New Yorkers. Critical to most effectively responding to the relentless attacks on immigrants, as the report identifies, is collaboration and the effective coordination of programs. Legal services providers and community-based organizations recognize the urgent need to work alongside government partners, avoiding costly duplication of work in a concerted effort to help protect and ensure universal access to justice for non-citizens in New York. NSC Defense, or an NSC Community Legal Defense, requests um, Moya, the city council, legal services providers, and community-based organizations work collaboratively in the coming year to fund and facilitate necessary new initiatives, including NSC defense, to most efficiently and effectively meet our communal aspiration in providing all non-citizens in New York meaningful access to justice and to combat the incessant attacks on non-citizens in New York City. NSC community defense in particular uh, has focused, and prior to our uh, beginning this organization, we were at another organization where we focused on individuals who have final orders of removal. In the past, these individuals um, were beneficiaries of the prior administration's um, decision not to target them. However, under the Trump administration, we all have seen, and I think the Moya report um, addresses the fact that this group of people has been uh, targeted. Non-citizens with final orders of removal are both generally ineligible for legal services currently provided in New York City and also at greater risk of summary and immediate deportation. Defending this population of non-citizens requires representation combining flexibility to respond instantly with expertise assessing emergency relief in federal courts, most or often in the form of temporary restraining order to prevent removal as legal claims are presented. The experience working in immigration court system including the Board of Immigration Appeals level to holistically assess cases and opportunities for relief from removal, not previously pursuing or competently presented, and three, the ability to engage and involve community-based organizations, other legal service providers, elected officials, 
and any other available resources or partners put forth a comprehensive defense. The Moore Report is both a testament to the immigration services currently provided in New York City, as well as an unsettling reminder of the overwhelming need for legal defense that is not provided by other organizations in New York City. NSC Community Legal Defense in particular provides um, representation in federal litigation that has been effective and proven to stop deportations and allow New Yorkers to remain with their communities and their families. It is also a reminder of why effective, relentless, experience in new models of defense, such as NSC defense, must be funded to, to best protect individuals, their families, and our community, communities from the continued and relentless assault by the Trump administration. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rex Chen. I'm the Director of Immigration for Legal Services NYC. Um, LSNYC helps over 100,000 low-income New Yorkers every year with a wide range of civil legal services. Um, we helped over 20,000 immigrants and their family members with immigration services uh, last year, including helping asylum seekers and domestic violence victims. Um, our intake staff saw a large increase in immigration questions uh, since November 2016, and we continue to get a hi very high volume of immigration questions. Uh, in the past two years, um, the number of people who benefited from our immigration services increased by 30 percent. Um, so thank you for your support. Um, turning to some things about Moya's plan for 2019, uh, we do appreciate the focus on economic justice for immigrant New Yorkers. Um, LSNYC held a conference uh, just yesterday where our entire staff brainstormed about economic justice issues and the systemic barriers to equality. So it won't be easy, but we're glad that Moya and the City Council are thinking about it. A and we also appreciate Moya's work on language access issues. Uh, we have seen how important this issue is. LSNYC has been working on language access issues with NYCHA, uh, with the court system, and also in other areas. Um, so we're looking forward to working with you and with Moya in these challenging times. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> um, hi, good afternoon. My name is Mina Selvin, and I am the intern paralegal representing Malik Law Firm. Uh, it's truly an honor to, sp uh, to speak before you, and I'm impressed with the city's efforts um, in being proactive and advocating for immigrants in NYC. So since the start of my internship, I had the fortune of receiving arrest exposure to different immigration cases. I had the opportunity to meet clients who had been victims of violence and clients who were in removal proceedings. I have begun working on cancellations of removal proceedings for some clients, including some of them are students who have been studying in the US and now are being challenged with the psychological, economic, and financial hardships provoked by their removal from the US. And it is truly disheartening to witness the difficult difficulties our firm's clients and immigrants nationwide face because of the issues with the system. As a student at the University of Notre Dame, um, I've been inspired to pursue social justice issues, um, especially since the foundation of my school is rooted in protecting the dignity of all human beings. Um, so we need the city and the mayor to be on our side to protect the rights of immigrants, especially under this administration. The increasingly strict scrutiny of immigrants under this administration is self-destructive because it has ha harmed family members like children and spouses who are U United States citizens and are subject to suffering because they lo no longer have the emotional and financial support of a parent and or a spouse. So in addition, the administration has capped the amount of cases uh, an immigration judge can cancel. In, uh, by the time the judge reads a case, the children will age out and will no longer be eligible for cancellation. Um, there's no reason for a cap and it's detrimental to American society. So we need the aid of your office, mayor's office, to lobby Congress in removing the cap on the cases that can be canceled. Um, thank you for your time and I appreciate, re appreciate you offering us the platform to raise our concerns. Thank you for that. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chaya Chan, and thank you, um, Chairman Tucker, for holding this hearing. Um, I am the executive director of Mekong NYC, 
um, and thank you for um, make, um, bringing up our community issue earlier as well. And so Mekong is uh, the only organization in New York City that serves the Southeast Asian community. Um, and our mission is to improve the quality of life of the Southeast Asian community in the Bronx and throughout New York City through community organizing, arts and culture programming, and providing a safety net through the improved access to critical social services. And you know, we came here in the 1980s as part of the refugee resettlement program. And in response to Moyer annual report, the service and program laid out in the report do not reach our community. Even more, the report and other assessments of immigrant communities and their needs in New York City often leave out our community's experience and the barrier facing our community who continue to be invisible. Since the 1980, approximately 10,000 Cambodians and Vietnamese have lived in the Bronx. The Southeast Asian refugee community have been in this country in New York City for almost 40 years after being forced to flee Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos because of the war in Southeast Asia, a conflict that was intensified by the US foreign policy agenda. As a result, our community experienced war, genocide, and refugee camps only to be brought into the US as part of the largest resettlement program and into the ghetto. So we live at the intersection of what we call refugee poverty and also um, urban poverty. Um, here in New York City, Cambodians and Vietnamese were largely resettled into the Bronx. And you know, we have one of the highest deportation rate of any community. And you know, a few weeks ago when the movie came out, um, uh, I came as a refugee in 1985 with my family. And when the movie came out around Central Park Five, we had been holding a lot of these deportation cases of Cambodian young men and Vietnamese men who came when they were 12, 13, 14. I'm so sorry. It's OK. Take your time. Oh, my brothers, my uncle are now being deported. And we came as refugee children and were tried as an adult, incarcerated for years. And now what's happening in New York City that no one knows in New York State is the constant raids and roundup of Cambodians and Vietnamese and Laotian people and people that's been out of incarceration at the detention centers for over 20 years. They own nail salons and small businesses and all, everything, and, and now are being deported. Um, I mean, this, this is just one of the many issues that our community deal with. And I think that you know, um, no one has asked what's the state of our community since our resettlement. Um, and the, the fact of the matter is that we did our own research focus group, and it has remained the same. We're the most invisible, highest dropout rate, lowest income attainment, uh, working in nail salons and factories, um, and the the deportation of our people is the ultimate failure of the refugees resettlement program. And Mekong, as a small organization, we only started seven years ago, and in essence, we're doing everything because we're trying to undo or redo the refugee resettlement program. And we call upon the city to really re-examine and re and look at what's happening in our community and what what has been we've been abandoned by the government. Um, and there is um, a responsibility and accountability that I think we need to talk about and, and share around what, what has happened since our arrival to the United States in the Bronx in New York City. So thank you. Thank you for uh, the testimony, but also for highlighting what I think is incredibly important for us to understand, not just as a, as a budget request, or, right. but as, as families with history and uh, with a sense of, of a, a real just demand for attention, and especially as a New Yorker. So I want to say thank you for, for being here. Um, I did see your testimony before, um, which allowed me to ask the question that I did, and, and it didn't seem like there was a connection. And so she agreed to a meeting, and so I hope that she can go, and if I can go with her, uh, with Commissioner Mustafi, to go and visit and here directly, um, that's the first step to a great. relationship building um, opportunity with the city agency. And then what I'm gonna kind of do an overview of all the all the work, be it the, the, the kind of new, uh, uh, the new focus on a response to Trump and what's happening with ICE and the deportation proceedings that are happening and the expanded sense of, of judges at uh, Varick Street, all of that um, begs us to change the way that we're doing it too, and and that's what we're trying to do. And that's what we're trying. That's why we're being so uh, critical of this mayor right now to ensure that we can, he can do his best, not 
for any other reason than by the people of New York. And that's why you're here. And that's where we're here to listen. And I think one thing that I'm gonna say as a final thought is when we think about language access as an example, and this, this may apply to everything else that we've been talking about, like legal services, um, the idea that we have like top 10 languages and that we're gonna do everything around top 10 languages doesn't fit to this question about immigrants being connected and feeling, feeling visible, feeling heard, feeling connected to government. And that it might say to us, okay, so there's top 10, there, there are top 10 languages spoken in the city, so we should, we should focus our, maybe our TV ads and our subway ads on those uh, languages, but that we still have a plan to ensure that every single immigrant has a connection in some way. And so this is where the interpreter, the legal interpreter bank comes in to, to fill in any gaps, because any gap is unacceptable, period. That's, that's, that's what I feel, that's what I believe. And, and so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the work that we've been doing and a lot of it is here. This is the partnership between you as the community, us as the council and the mayor's office. That that's what this represents at the end of the day. But I'm not satisfied, I'm not. And I think that one of the things that we need to figure out is how we build those um, moments of legislative policy and budget victories to address those gaps. And this is why you're here, and this is why we heard very plainly about either legal services or, uh, or communities that have felt invisible. That, that is unacceptable here in the city of New York. We can, we can do better, and, and we will. And so with that, I'm gonna say thank you all for being here today, and for, um, for, your, for your responses and for your ideas, and let's continue the conversation. Thank you.